Hi welcome back guys this is your friend, WTFW with another fiction. What if Deku had his own army now before starting please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this now let's get into the fanfic. After everyone had watched the second chapter of the show, everyone was led on their own while their host, Kuma, was elsewhere. The women were without a doubt enjoying their spa, massage, mud baths, anything related to becoming younger and beautiful was there. Oh, this is heaven. Kayoka groaned in delight while she was being massaged by an agenda robot. I don't know you girls, but I am enjoying this. That's good to hear, Jiru. Momo smiled as she was resting with a special face mask and two cuts of cucumber placed on her eyes. This is much better than the places I've been around the world. Oh, I wish my parents were to be here to test these massages. You tell me, Toru giggled, sitting next to her with the same treatment despite being invisible. Our parents are really missing this. A little lower, please. Oh, right there. Mina moaned when the massager pressed the place she wanted to. Ah, this is life. You sight in delight as she and Nimiri felt the warm waters course their tired bodies. Haven't thought about getting a spa in years. I'm going to milk them. You and me, hun. Nimiri giggled as she lowered herself in the water. You and me, both. This does really good for my skin, I say. Komori said, enjoying the warm water. I love this experience, Pony agreed. M.H. Yui nodded. Still though, Riaiko began. Despite all of this, I wonder if our host, Kuma, had thought of this beforehand. Well, at the beginning, he had mentioned that he was fan of our universe, whatever he meant. On and finally out of her bulky astronaut suit, showing her well-developed body and showing her navy blue and blonde hair with hazel-colored eyes said as she enjoyed the waters out of her suit. So, you think that since he had known that we were coming, prepared all of this for us? Ruko Pixie Bob said as she took the opportunity to be younger than ever. I feel so spoiled like a little kitty. Pixie, where are your team, by the way? Nimiri asked as you became so bliss with the water that was rendered too relaxed to answer. Oh, well, since Tomoko's quirk returned, she and Shino decided to train her quirk, as since hers was stolen. She lost the edge of using her quirk. Meanwhile, Yawara is training elsewhere. Don't know where. Ruko shrugged. Again. Shino commanded as Tomoko concentrated again, while using her returned quirk. Search. I see the kits going around in the playground, the girls in the spa, and I see Aizawa, Eri, and Mirio together in the recreational room. Tomoko said, disconnecting her quirk. Oh, it's been a while. I think I'm going to cry. I'm really happy for you, Tomoko. Shino said honestly. The wild, wild pussycats wasn't much without you. Shino. The greenette of the team cried gratefully, hugging the team leader. I missed it too. I see that Ragdoll is doing well with her recuperated quirk. Ruko Rukiu said as she walked alone toward them. Oh, Rukiu, I thought you would be with Mirko, Shino pointed out. Well, she's over there kicking ass to those training robots, the dragon hero said, watching as Rumi was fighting two bulking-sized robots at the same time. Surprisingly, those robots are put with different power level, depending on the rankings of villains. Ranking, Tomoko asked wiping her joyful tears. Ruko shrugged. From what one of the guide robots said, the robots are configured with various levels like we use in real life. It goes from D rank to S rank, and Rumi is testing by fighting two ranks, one going fist to fist and the other going with a mace. There goes that these robots are also configured to copy the exact quirk and move sets as the original of the villains which are in the data. Teshiro said as he was taking a break, while eating on his second box of margarita pizza. So, in other words, this training ground gives us chance to practice and strategize against villains that we already fought or are going to fight against. Shinagu hummed thoughtfully. It would help me by strengthening my fiber master quirk. 
An excellent place for training, I must admit. Yasuhiro hummed in honest joy as he was checking on his blades. Still though, our host had prepared us too much for this that I feel quite pampered. Shinya said with a slight frown while crossing his arms. He did say that he was a fan of our universe. Shinji remarked, making on to the most famous ranked heroes, like he wasn't trembling in slight fear and trepidation. So, what makes you think that he had seen something that we needed more time to prepare? That could have been a possibility. Teishiro hummed, going now with a chocolate cake. Still, enough of that thought. What are we thinking about Midoriya? Shino asked. She was especially grateful for the Greenettes' help during their visit or else she would have lost her nephew from muscular. The kid is still green, pun intended, but he has a heart that would rival all might. Tomoko stated, We have come to be part of a secret that was guarded by few, Shinya said, feeling a little dizzy with the secret being exposed. It feels like we are discovering secrets we shouldn't know of. Speaking of the Greenette, have anyone seen him? Sinagu wondered. I might have found him in Django in the shooting range with Snipe and few others with my quirk. Tomoko confessed. Is that a good idea for Midoriya using guns? Shino asked in concern. It might have been more to reconnect between those two. Ruko assumed, knowing that the two brothers needed some time. They do not know much apart from what we are watching, but those two passed to many terrible things despite that they don't know each other. It seems that it is like some kind of reconnection between two people. Every hero paused at the thought of that and contemplated that line of thought, before Shinji grimaced dreadfully as everyone else. But seriously, with guns. This is a DC-15A blaster rifle the standard rifle for each clone that use in battle. Django explained, holding said rifle with reverence. This was our first model of weapon that the armory made so it has been useful in battles. He grabbed the shorter, but still two-handed weapon. DC-15's blaster carbine. Shorter than the first cousin but sacrifices range for accuracy and more capacity from 50 shots to 100. It gives the best option for scouting missions. Eventually, more useful to dual wield it, but a sidearm or other. Leaving the carbine on the table with the rest of the weapons, he picked up a pistol. DC-17 Hand Blaster. A clone's best friend if the first one is lost or destroyed. Mostly used by high-ranking clones and the jetpack troopers. 50 bolts. It has the same power as many other guns. Izuku mused out as he shot a few bolts to the target dummies, scorching the target points. True, but as most guns, they have stun settings. Django grinned as he then showed the other weapons that the clones used, such as the M3 Bulwark Blast Shield also known as Riot Shield, an RPS-6 rocket launcher most used as anti-vehicle DC-17M and DC-15's sidearm blaster, which were used by the clone commandos thermal detonators, and Django and few other clones favorite in case of a dire situation or anti-unit solution. The Z6 Rotary Blaster Cannon. This beautiful would carve a group of mad bulls without stopping. He said with vindictive glee. Wow, a minigun. Izuku gazed at the monstrosity of a weapon in awe, and few others who wanted to test the guns the clones used. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. Django scoffed raising his favorite weapons and spinning them between his fingers. But nothing is compared to these beauties. Two custom fits Westar 34 blaster pistols. Perfect for a surprise attack at close range. I modified their handles to be hollowed out so I can fast draw them easily. They are capable of shooting 20 bolts each before I have to reload them. I have to say, partner, that I think that I'll have to keep one of them for my guns. Snipe Sensei, Izuku said as he watched the cowboy-themed hero coming toward them. My quirk is compatible with them, and I think that since a few of the models of guns that I tried are chargeable on its own, so I don't have to worry about reloading in dire moments. Toru hummed in excitement, being able to hold a few weaponries of the clones. True, 
Some of the guns have large capacity and or are rechargeable. Django shrugged. But those models have to be special since those require more time to produce. So we can only use what's available. Fine by me. Still though, it is good to finally meet you, Django. I know we said this before, but this just feels like Izuku rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Like a dream, Django snorted, shaking his head. Yeah, I know. Maybe that Kuma guy knew what he wanted to do when he brought me here. And I'm happy by it. I mean, I am sad that I won't see my Oravod, but it feels like I gained another one. So, whatever happens, I'm with you through the end. Izuku wasn't to cry. He promised himself. Okay, he was crying and Django was tearing up. He quickly wiped it off. Damn it, Django. You sure know how to make me cry, you dummy. Django laughed as he patted his Oravod shoulder. Oh, don't be such a crybaby, Izuku. I've known you since I was born, or well, created out of your mindscape. And I know better on how to tease you. Izuku gasped in betrayal. You wouldn't. Django's grin stretched with mischief. I didn't stutter. The two remained staring at each other before they laughed like any other family would do. Toru simply watched the spectacle with a smile under his mask. He knew that Midoriya felt so much wrongness throughout his life. But here, he knew that he was going to be simply fine. Speaking of it, Izuku interrupted, sobering his laugh. I wonder what Kuma is doing at the moment. He needed a long time to do, but we don't know for sure what he's going to be doing. Django shrugged. Beats me. Maybe he's trying to bring another VOD like 77. I don't know. They were now wondering what Kuma would be doing. In one spacious room, featuring many bear-themed furniture from floor rags, drawings, action figures, a desk with a bear head carved on the wood, and few other non-bear-themed posters from many other heroes and villains and few YouTubers and anime he enjoyed before stood the host of the show, walking around or in circles with panic. Are you kidding me? Are you sure you want me to show them that? Kuma exclaimed, holding a futuristic phone over his bare ear like it was normal, his face showing dread and trepidation like someone is going to destroy someone's favorite toy. I know I got your permission, Draco. But I thought it wouldn't such a deal to bring that story. Ah, 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 bud. A baritone voice chastised him playfully over the other side. First of, you asked about my permission to bring my side of the multiverse so that the original verse would be able to enjoy what I cooked up. But I have the final say if you want to show the rest of my world. And I want to show them a side of the multiverse I created. That universe is one of my many successful ones. Kuma grimaced, rubbing his face like he hadn't slept in days despite that they can't, but they want to. Look, I know that you have the final saying, but I wanted to show them the Legion side of the story, and maybe add the clones ones. But that? Really? Of course. Draco scoffed like it was obvious. It is important that they understand that actions have consequences, and that anything is possible. Kuma kept the phone away for a second to breathe in and out and rub the bridge of his nose. Okay, you may have a point on that. And I can agree that they need to see a few of their choices and the butterfly effect. Still, at this rate, this might give them some existential crisis bullshit or something. He could feel Draco sighing ruefully do not ask how and continue. Perhaps, but better than they learn now than suffer later. Kuma could feel his stamina drain up like a vacuum cleaner sucking dirt greedily. Fine, I'll show them that. Still, I think your world is becoming more successful. We, as overseers of the multiverse, get quite bored with the original ones that each of us would mold a world of our own image. And I have to say that I enjoyed quite a bit of yours, Draco. Draco scoffed. Of course it was. Well, that's my part of the thing I wanted to say to you, but I didn't think it would reach to the point that you were asking me about adding that story at the end. Kuma sighed wearily, tossing himself onto a black bean bag. Well, no time like the present. Draco drawled. I need to go. 
I think my Izuku is doing something, and I don't want to miss it. Yeah, yeah, see you later, Draco. You too, horn guy. With that, Draco disconnected the call. Just because in my universe Izuku has another childhood friend with horns, doesn't mean that I have to be called horn guy, and this is my theme. He clicked his tongue before getting up from his seat, snatched a bottle of juice from the desk and drank in a big gulp. Pa, that's much better. He huffed and prepared as he stretched and began walking toward the exit and get to the show. After announcing the resume of the show, everyone who was enjoying their fun groaned or sighed as they made their way toward the cinema theater. Students wore their uniforms while the heroes used their own costumes. Even Tomoko wore her cat uniform again with glee as the rest of the wild. Wild pussycats welcomed gladly at their teammate. All right, everyone. Time is wasting. But I have an announcement to make, Kuma said, earning their attention. At the end of the show, by the suggestion of the original owner of the show, asked me to show one of his works to you to see your reactions. Tenure raised his hand. Mr. Kuma, what do you mean by that? Well, my dear Ida Kun, it is to say that we, as overseer of the multiverse, are quite bored of our monotonous life. So, we bring new multiverses and watch on how they flow. Kuma explained, the heroes getting more interested on his explanation. As we oversee every multiverse we are given, we enjoy our own creations and such. And we also watch others with their permission, of course. Mina perked up at an idea she thought of. Does it mean that everyone here would be different in those multiverses? Katsuki gave the pink alien a weird look. Since when you can think like that? He asked in honest curiosity. Hey! Kuma laughed at the response which others joined, not in malice. Well, Ashido-chan, there are many alternative universe or as we would love to call those which depends on each one of ours desire to happen. Which are? Denki asked, intrigued as everyone else. There are many possibilities. Kuma spread his arms, showing snippets of different universes. There would be universes that a few of you would be related one to another like our dear Katsuki being Yu's cousin on the mother side. She is my cousin? Katsuki roared in offense. I take offense of being related to that ditzy woman. Hey, you shouted indignantly. Would you prefer Nimuri or Himiko? Kuma grinned at the now tense and pale Katsuki. That would be a nightmare, Shouta grumbled with Nimuri swatting his arm, mildly offended. I can't see them together as relatives, if I'm honest. Tsuyu pointed out bluntly with a few others nodding in agreement. So... The multiverse can be diverse in such way. Shoto mumbled before he raised his hand. So that means that... Yes, Shoto-kun, Kuma answered flatly, expecting his question in the first place. There are worlds that Izuku is related to All Might as his father. Izuku and Tashinori blushed at the thought of being related. While they each other think that they are their father-son pseudo-like, they weren't in a familiar relationship. Although Tashinori thought with a blush, thinking on the lovely mother of his protege. Kuma snorted, while listening to his thoughts. Yeah, this Tashinori is likely the many possibilities of being enamored with Inko. Inji somehow shivered at the thought that out of every that was related to him, Shoto would have gotten his conspiracy theorist urges. He remembered the time when he thought that Sorohiko was Tashinori's father, Shivers. He hoped to have forgotten those embarrassing years. That is why he started to get better on his detective skills after that failure of thought. Does relationships count too? Toru asked, raising her invisible hand. Yeah, most likely. Kuma nodded. There are multiverses that some of you are in relationship or not, depending on the gender you are. Our gender? Tensei asked with a confused frown. Well, most universes are much put to the class A and B kids here. Kuma motioned as he waved at said group. While a few of you people might be in relationship, there are multiverses that have you meet our dear Izuku early on. A few of companionship, brotherhood, and such that many enjoy having a friend like him. He's a great friend, Tenya declared. 
He's capable of showing us the best of us, Achako cheered. He's understandable of others' problem, Shoto intoned. He's charismatic, Tsuyu bluntly pointed out. Izuku began blushing redder than before as soon as his closest friends began giving him compliments. Others also added their opinions on him, which something inside warmed him. Django smirked at the state of his vod was having and couldn't be proud of him. Okay, okay, that's great. Kuma interrupted in amusement. We don't want our broccoli boy turn into a strawberry. Everyone glanced at the embarrassed Izuku and could see his head looking like the fruit. Then, everyone laughed making Izuku nuclear red. All right, all right, people. Enough of teasing him. Back to what we were speaking about, the multiverse which a few of you people would endear the other to get into a romantic relationship. Still, our little cinnamon roll would end up with one or many others. Many others, Denki and Minoru shouted in unison. Midoriya, you bastard. Minoru continued, raging all the way. The few girls of his classmates blushed at the thought of being with him, mostly Ochako, who was the closest to him. The class B was more confused or intrigued while glancing at said person. Teachers and few other female heroes are also added, but that depends on the situation. Kuma continued burning the fire while the heroes were looking at Izuku with raised eyebrows. He is sometimes added with May if he ended up being a support student or not. Neat, May said. Other would be with Melissa since both of them band together because of their quirklessness. Melissa, who had been quiet all the show, was blushing while David didn't know how to feel about that. Despite the other multiverse, I won't let you get a boyfriend unless he is capable. David decided for the best. But Daddy... Melissa whined with a blush before lowering her voice. What if it is Midoriya? David grimaced and began grumbling incoherently, which Melissa didn't know what the answer was. There are a few with the female heroes, Kuma considered telling or not, and then shrugged. Either if he was the same age as them or as it is. Nimiri giggled before being splashed by Shouta with a bottle of water. No. But Shouta? The little kid would be. No. Also, a few of the guys as girls or him as a woman. Kuma grinned when a few of the guys shuddered before he rolled his eyes and snapped his fingers. Yeah, don't worry. This is Izuku turned into a girl. A new panel showed up a female version of Izuku who looked cuter and had the angelic vibe. Which it could be said to the male version. Django could only cackle at the sight of his vod turned into a woman. He then paused and thought about it, and grimaced with a pale look if his vod had legion. It could have been to make female version of his vod, which would also mean bastards trying to get their first hand them. He gagged at the thought. So, after the show and the additional, I'm going to show you a part of it. Kuma grinned, and his grin stretched more when Izuku paled. W8. No. Too late for that. Now sit your asses down, or I'm going to bring a few people to watch together. Kuma grinned mischievously when Izuku quietly sat down. Ah, uh, who could you have brought here, if you can answer my curiosity? Shinso asked in honest curiosity as few others. Kuma hummed, rubbing his chin in a thoughtful manner. Well, I could bring Midoriya Inko into this place to watch. Izuku yelped an eep. Or bring Bakugo Masaru and Mitsuki. Katsuki instantly paled at that. Or a few parents of the students. Some students were tense at that. The few that didn't say anything were Shinso and Mei. Or a few heroes to enjoy the show. You know, a certain comedic heroine. You wouldn't dare. Shouta instantly bolted up from his seat in accusatory look. Kuma chuckled as he sat down with the snacks coming toward him. You can try, Aizawa sensei Ooh, I always wanted to say that, but anyways I can bring a new person to this show. With a snap of his fingers, another Izuku appeared with a shirt with a number 77. Before anybody could say something, Kuma interrupted. You are here to join us to see the show of your VOD's life, and you were the second to be brought to life or well, the reality. 
Kuma waved his hand. In any case, you don't have to give your name yet. Just give them your CT number, and so until the show gives your name. Until then, enjoy the time you have here with a few VOD of yours that I'll bring after more. 77 blinked in confusion before his eyes turned to Django and widened in shock. J. Django, is it you? Django smiled and gave his VOD a hug. I am here, 77. You are among friends and heroes. At ease. 77 gasped for the touch, not trying to think that it was a dream. For a few tense moments, 77 sagged in relief and choked on his tears, while giving his fallen Vod a hug. A few others wondered what had happened, but kept quiet, knowing that it was moment that they needed. Toshinori and Sorohiko knew best, since they were reunited with Nana and Murai. So they did their best to give those two clones the time they needed. Kuma closed his eyes with a smile, feeling the gratitude of one another. After giving them a few more minutes, 77 quickly wiped his tears as Django gave him a smile. It's good to be back, 77. I think we got too much time until then, don't you think? 77 nodded and went to grab his snack, and surprisingly, instead of sitting next to the Deku squad, he went and sat next to Yuga, who in turn gaped in surprise and confusion. 77 simply gave him a small smile, which he returned with much twinkle. Now, since this is out of the way, let's continue with the next one, Kuma announced as everyone got into their seats. Courage makes heroes, but trust builds friendships. Words to live by. Toshinori stated warmly, raising his drink as few other heroes. The Deku squad glanced at each other with smiles, knowing how they felt about it. Arriving at the front gates of UA, Izuku found himself enthusiastic and ready to take on whatever challenges that would stand in his way. He found himself completely at peace with what the future had in store. Oh, I felt it like that too. Toru cheered joyfully. Was it like that to you too, Deku-kun? Achako asked. Why, yay. I was so nervous at the time, but I loved watching the gates of UA at the time. Izuku replied, Out of the way, Deku. And the moment is ruined. Wow, such way to ruin it, Rikido snorted. Revelry in the dark, Fumikich agreed. Izuku honestly just walked forward and kept ignoring Bakugo out of spite, the latter becoming incensed before noticing something, smirking, and moving away. Everyone blinked in confusion on what Katsuki had planned. Even himself was trying to understand his other version's action. Odd, that's a first. He thought before an upturned stone caught his foot and sent him tumbling. Instinct had him rolling as soon as he tipped over. Unfortunately, he soon found himself spinning in a circle uncontrollably. Whoa, what's happening? He cried out while moving like a wheel. That really sucked, Django chuckled. Yeah, since we see his actions through his eyes, everyone was panicking in his mindscape. 77 added with a snort. That would have been quite trippy. Denki joked. Is that how I looked? Izuku grimaced in embarrassment. Yeah, minus the shouting and that. Ochako assured him, giggling. I think you were more surprised than him. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. A girl said before grabbing Izuku and straightening him out, then pressing her hands together. The effects of her quirk were cancelled and Izuku stumbled, trying to get over his sense of vertigo. Idly he heard Bakugo's cackling laughter up ahead, neither expecting the turn of events. Oh, that's why I was smirking. Katsuki realized. You didn't see him almost fall, bro? Ijiro asked. Nah, I went ahead without even carrying Deku at the time. Ochako-chan. That is a wonderful way of saving Midoriya-chan. Suyu pointed out. Why, yeah, at the time I didn't want to think how he would trip over, giving himself some bad luck. Ochako confessed with a blush. I'm so sorry. I tried using my quirk so that you wouldn't fall, cause that would be bad luck. And well, yeah. The girl sheepishly said while twiddling with her fingers. See? Although. It is different of how we met, Izuku said, 
not recalling being that scared and so. It, it's all right. Just got a bit confused there. I'm Midoriya Izuku. May I have the name of my attempted savior? He asked with a smile as he continued to walk forward. Oh, I'm Uraraka Ochako. Are you trying out for the hero course? Yep, I have to ask. What exactly is your quirk? I don't think it's levitation or telekinesis due to how you move your palms and the glow that came from your fingers. Is it some sort of touch-based manipulation? Hmm, considering the effects of vertigo and how I seem to roll in one spot, is it some of gravity manipulation? Izuku rambled before a hand came out of nowhere and popped him on the head. Quirk nerd. Shinso snorted. Can you blame me? Izuku asked incredulously in mild offense. There are millions of quirks that are capable of changing the lives of the people. And there are many possibilities that if done well, people would be capable of using them perfectly. Midoriya's brain something to behold. Nezu cackled in glee. I expect once we return to have him taught by me. Every teacher paled in terror at such declaration. And if Shouta was thinking of hiding Izuku with Toshinori's help, well, he now had the help of the others. Jeez, Vod brother. I thought that you already got that mumbling habit of yours under control. Django said, while turning to the girl. Sorry about him. Get a cool quirk and a pretty girl in his face, and he's lost. Ooh. The class of shippers Mina and Toru Kud, while a few girls from class B agreed completely with them. The two pointed out blushed and covered their faces into their hands in embarrassment. Django. Django, Izuku yelled in embarrassment as the girl blushed up a storm. Izuku tried to swipe at him, but Django dodged and circled away laughing. Sorry about him. He's an idiot. I it's fine. Yoraka said, while trying to gain control of her blush. Oh, young love, how I love this. Nimiri giggled. Please, Nimiri, not right now. Shouta groaned in dismay. Hisashi could only laugh at that. He he, I'm Django, nice to meet ya. He said, staying just out of range. Izuku was tempted to shoot him. Anyway, thanks for saving this dickhead idiot, but it looks like we need to get inside. Come on. He then ran ahead, leaving the other two behind. Izuku sighed before turning to what was hopefully a new friend and classmate. Shall we? Yuraraka nodded, and they both moved ahead. So, was I right? About your quirk? Yuraraka giggled. Quite different of how our first meeting went, Deku-kun, Achako mumbled in embarrassment. Why, yeah, Izuku agreed. Django and 77 could only laugh at the predicament of their vat. Izuku had to admit, he was only half paying attention to present Mike's well presentation. Truthfully, he had already met the bombastic man before, a reward that All Might had provided after he had managed to finally use Ofa safely. Getting the autographs of some of UA's teachers was one of the best days of his life. Look, Chu, the little listener is overjoyed with our autographs, Hizashi yelled happily. Would you kindly not shout next to my ear? Shouta growled. He would probably be happier to accept autographs from any hero. Mimiri pointed out in amusement. Snipe had even dedicated that last few weeks before the exam teaching them proper firearm safety. If only because he as a hero would not stand for anything else. If by chance another hero with firearms had the potential to enter the exam and continue against the stigma. Well, it good thing nobody had telepathy nearby. Well, the laws of the use of guns had changed much since the years, Anan remarked. Izuku had also managed to keep up the contact with the clones inside of him, somewhat. The connection was mostly one way for some reason, but recent reports from Django were that the clones were taking Snipes' lessons to heart and were steadily increasing their capabilities with weapons. If by odd chance he heard the random explosion in his mind, well, Nothing he could do about it now. Ah, good times to practice. 77 chuckled. Of course, 
the clones take their training to the point that they could shoot on their sleeps. Django snorted. Please don't. Izuku begged. It still begged the question. Could he enter his mindscape? If so, what was necessary? Questions for later, he supposed. Huh, he's sure enthusiastic, I guess Izuku thought, while staring at some guy who was, well, asking wasn't really the right word here, but still, should at least be polite. He might be nervous about the different villains they would face. Apologizes for interrupting. Mike Sensei, it was right to assume that I was nervous and confused during your explanation. Tenya apologized, bowing to the teachers. It's all right, little listener. I could have expected the nervousness at least. Hizashi shrugged, waving his hand. No harm done. You sure about that? Tensei asked, raising an eyebrow at the voice hero. A. It was expected that nobody would have answered me. But I would have been if at least one had. He replied with a shrug. That would have been a headache, Shouta grumbled, drinking his juice packs. He summarily ignored Bakugo. Later. Inside the training ground. And wow was this place huge. According to Django who was currently in the mindscape. They'd asked and quirks could not be activated until after the exam started. Mentioned offhandedly that it was about the same size as the mindscape. Izuku had some trouble processing that one. Wow, so that Midoriya's mindscape would have been quite big. Pony said in awe. It would be possible that the mindscape would grow the same as Midoriya. Satsuna hummed. You know, grow in age, and the mindscape follows. I wonder how big it would be if he reached his thirties. Riaiko wondered. Like the size of Tokyo, perhaps? Sen asked. It could be, Kosai replied, unsure of his answer. Looking around he found Yuraraka in the same training area and was about ready to walk over to her when a hand grabbed his shoulder. Wow, that sucks. Mina huffed. Midoriya, I apologize. That wasn't my intention, and I had misunderstood completely. Tenya apologized. It's fine, Ida kun It's already in the past, and I forgave you, Izuku said. Not for long, Django muttered, and before anybody could ask him, he pointed up. The person holding his shoulder soon found his wrist grabbed and a gun in his face. Well, you're fucked. Hanta snorted. That was uncalled for, you idiot. Kyoka grunted, swatting his shoulder. You can't blame him. Ida got himself into a prickle on his own. Denki defended. Now let's just calm down, eh? No need to try and start everything, right? Django said with a grin, as the other teen's eyes widened in shock. E, excuse me. Are you allowed to even have those weapons? Although I am shocked to have a gun pointed at me. That wasn't a question that needed to be answered. Tenya sighed to himself. Was I really that tense? Don't worry much about it, Ida kun Izuku assured him with the other members of the Deku squad, nodding in agreement. Rules don't matter to me. I'm just a quirk. Django chuckled out as the group around them spread from the standoff. Really, Django? Izuku sighed as he moved away from the teen's now lax grip. Midoriya? Django? Everything all right here? Yuraraka asked as she just now noticed the commotion. Start. Such timing, Kayoka snorted. I was nervous myself and wouldn't notice until it was late. Achako said. Each on their own, I guess. Suyu shrugged. Everyone paused and looked over to where present Mike was. What are you waiting for? There are no countdowns in real life. Go. As one the entire crowd moved toward the city, Izuku and Django immediately grouped up, passing toward Izuku a carbine and some thermal detonators. And wasn't that a shock to find in the armory? Go, do a crime. Denki joked with a grouchy voice before laughing with few others. Is it really necessary to meme? Kayoka groused. Hey, the show gives us great moment to add memes. He defended. And it's funny. Ijiro chuckled. Don't say that you aren't enjoying it. Kayoka simply huffed and crossed her arms, not admitting that a few of them were funny. Momo simply laughed on her hand at the dishonesty of her best friend. 
All right, you go left, I go right. We'll meet up around the end of the ten minutes. Check your fire, down. Django yelled, knocking down Izuku and quickly shooting a one-pointer. Thanks, behind you. Django ducked and Izuku took some shots. The robot exploding into a mess of shrapnel. Let's go, stay frosty. Django said as they split up and went after points. Nice work on the shots and combinations. Toru said, humming in appreciation at the tactics they used. They trained for this. It would have been a waste, otherwise. Rumi snorted. They're still kid, Rumi, Ruko said. In any case, they are covering their backs and not wasting shots. Sugo hummed, surprisingly calmer than his usual self. They work well, Hugo pointed out. Izuku went towards a group of various robots that had actually pinned down some students against some rubble. Grabbing one of the detonators, he tossed it towards the group, blowing up some and scattering the rest. Hey, aim for the head, he cried out as he rolled and shot some more robots, leaving the rest of the group to deal with. He charged forward and moved quickly the embers of one for all sparking to life under his skin. I always wanted to do this. One for all. Yehil Biskargim full armor. Okay, so it was a work in progress. I prefer calling one for all, full cowling. Izuku said, glad that he could now speak freely about the secret he was holding. That is a mouthful. Ochako agreed. I quite prefer myself using names that can be said in a hastily manner. Tenya commented. Moving even faster, he burst in between two one-pointers and shot them from behind. After that, he moved upwards, jumping between the walls of an alleyway to get to higher ground. I hope Django's doing worse than me. Can't lost that bet, Izuku said before a sudden rumble made everything shake. Turning around, he spotted the absolutely ginormous zero-pointer in front of him. Izuku sighed. Others sighed in agreement, while those that took the recommendation exam blinked in surprise. That was the zero-pointer you mentioned? Momo asked Kayoka. Yup. No way in hell we could have taken it out. She replied with a huff. It gave us quite a scare. Mashiro sighed. Yeah, Toru agreed. Although, I heard mine was destroyed. Mizo told the others. Huh, I wonder who could have done that. Rikido wondered aloud. Those that were there turned to the greenette, who was looking at them sheepishly. Right, it was a no-brainer. The sugary hero sighed. That made everyone laugh. Django was actually doing pretty well, all things considered. Well, if you didn't count the fact that he was surrounded by robots. Ha, huh, this is just too easy. I'm winning that bet for sure. Django yelled in excitement as he started to spin and fire. Fortunately, they were mostly one-pointers, so they didn't have any ranged capabilities. Three were immediately eliminated within a few seconds of each other. Ducking and rolling, he ran and shot more, the blue bolts piercing through metal with deadly efficiency. Getting closer, Django was forced to make space, constantly moving, constantly firing. His pistols were starting to overheat and burn his hands. The smell of burnt circuits, and oil filled the air and Django was getting tired. Putting away a pistol, he tossed two grenades towards separate group of robots and blew them to smithereens. Brutality. Denki whistled. He knows what he is doing. Hanta hummed. Kind of reckless, Minoru pointed out, surprising the others that the pervert would at least thing which he took it in offense. Hey, I may perv, but I know what I'm seeing. It's more like we are surprised that you can coherently speak without making a perverted comment like you always do. Mizo decided to point him out. Rude, he grumbled, crossing his arms. People might take you seriously if you stopped ogling women like a piece of meat. Kuma dryly said. You respect their boundaries and they might see you differently. For now, you are on site kicked on the balls without mercy. The students laughed at that. But Minoru pondered that, and was thinking about changing himself. Meanwhile, Django was smirking cockily at Izuku, who responded with a roll of his eyes. 
Don't brat about it, Django. We know that I can do it better. Izuku replied with a snort. Oh, you wound me, but are you afraid that I would win that bet? Django sneered. I bet that they would end up tying or something. Ochako assumed. Yes, they are good on their own ways, and that might be the result of the match. Shoto affirmed that assumption. They're good. I'll give them that. Tenya nodded. I want to bet on it, Satsuna immediately declared. I bet 2,000 yen that Midoriya will win, Denki said excitedly. I think Django would do for 1,500, Hanta added. There were a few bets on either side, or a few preferred that both of them would win. Those were Mina, Satsuna, Ochako, Momo, Toru, and Katsuki, surprisingly. Others didn't join them. The heroes and teachers of UA were mostly quiet, watching their future of students, betting on the state of two individuals' results. What makes you think that both of them would win? Bakubro? Ijiro asked as he bet for Izuku. Katsuki simply snorted. That would be telling. Spotting a three-pointer, he bum-rushed it, firing at its support and joints before leaping on jumping onto its body and scrambling to its head, and firing point-blank. Its body crumbled, and he rolled off onto the concrete before continuing forward. Spotting a blonde boy hunched over in pain and a two-pointer about to strike him, he rushed forward and tackled him to the ground. It's me, Mon Ami, Yuga exclaimed with twinkles. Seventy-seven simply chuckled. That you are. It seems that your limits were hitting you hard. Rikido said worriedly. That is was. But fret not, Mon Ami that I will always return with more sparkles, Yuga said in delight. Everyone stared at the twinkles Yuga was sporting before turning to Kuma. Don't ask, he replied flatly. Turning quickly and firing at the bot, it soon became scrap metal under the barrage. Hissing in pain as he was forced to let go of his gun, he turned to the boy he'd saved. You all right? Django asked, picking up the teen. The blonde nodded, still clutching his stomach. Django noticed the specialized belt he was wearing and dragged him over to an alcove. M. Merci, thank you. Welcome. You need anything else? Just rest Mon Ami, my friend. I managed to grab 40 points. I think I made it. He said while panting before straightening out into a pose. After all, someone as glamorous as me can always shine. He reminds me of his purple highness before his retirement. Ruko hummed, which she didn't notice Shouta, who had been listening. Tensing at the name of the previous interned pro hero when, he shook his head. It wasn't the time to think about it at the moment. Hizashi and Nimiri, who were also listening to Pixie Bob's comments, glanced worriedly at Shouta, but didn't comment on it since they knew better to speak of that. Urukai then, good luck. Django said before quickly moving away and heading towards the middle. I lost track of how many points I got in that last scuffle. Hopefully I made more than Izuku. Either way though, we're totally making it in. Out of nowhere, debris shot upwards into the sky, sending him flying back. Towering above him was what was apparently the zero pointer. Django was not amused. You've got to be kidding me. That was terrifying. Nironjeki sighed. Yeah, no matter how my quirk works, I wouldn't be able to deal with that. Jiroda said with his arms crossed. Would I be able to disable it with my quirk? Juzo wondered aloud. Maybe. He would be able to soften the ground of that zero pointer and rendering its movement null. Kajiro said quietly. HN. Yui nodded in agreement. I think a few of us would be able to. Nito hummed, rubbing his chin. I think among our class, it would possibly be Kamakiri. Fukudashi if he is able to bring a powerful onomatopoeia Honuki and Bondo. That could be a possibility, Shroom. Kanoko agreed. Hearing that, the class a wondered out it too. Well, it would obviously be Deku-kun since he did that one too before. Achako said, recalling the time she thought the plain boy destroyed the zero-pointer to save her with a slight blush. And as for the others, 
It could be Todoroki, Bakugo, and maybe Yeomomo if she is able to bring something like a canon like the sport festival. Kaminari would be the same if he didn't have that drawback of his quirk. Izuku added. Denki was happy to hear that he would be able to destroy the Zero Pointer and was determined to be better and hold more electricity without getting into his Wii state. Hmm, the test hasn't even started, and we already have a confrontation between applicants. Hound observed. Good instincts honestly, but shouldn't we be worried about the firearms? Where'd they even come from? Midnight asked. I signed it off myself. Besides, they're produced by his quirk. All Might would, until the end of his days, be jealous at how easily Snipe could pull off a southern accent while speaking Japanese, eh? The best he could do was a half-hearted West Coast accent thanks to Dave. And he'd lived there, completely unfair in his opinion. Jealous much, partner? Toru smirked under his mask, and while nobody could see it, the tone of his voice would be his telling. No. Toshinori would deny that he was pouting. Ha ha ha. Don't be so glum, Toshi. David chuckled. It is harder than it sounds, but you'll know it later. Melissa could shake her head at her uncle Might's jealousness. Oh, uncle. Snipe. Please stop flexing on All Might. Besides, young Django was simply protecting young Midoriya. Nezu chided with some humor. And wasn't that a sigh? Nezu had taken a slight interest in both boys. Although since Django hadn't been training to wield Ofa, he was the one to spend more time with the principal. They shared a dark sense of humor and made jokes that would make anybody else gape in shock. Ah, take my fun away. So unfair. That's his quirk. It's been a while since I've seen a duplication quirk. And is he fully sentient, or just a copy? Ectoplasm asked, interested in seeing a quirk similar to his. I've had the opportunity to speak with young Django. Although he is a clone of Midoriya Izuku, he has his own personality traits, likes, and dislikes. We had a riveting discussion of military tactics and the art of war by Sun Tzu the other day. He cheerfully said while focusing a screen on him. As one the entire faculty shivered. Nezu having his eye on somebody was never good for their sanity. We're dead. The world is ending. Hizashi yelled dramatically and only this time. Shouta wouldn't blame him for that this time. Izuku was one thing but Django. Hell no. He would have a horrible time hiding them from the rat. Ha ha ha. Oh, don't worry, Mike. I won't be too hard for young Django, will I? Nezu asked nicely. Of course not, Principal Nezu. Django affirmed and smirked at the sight of the teacher's paled faces with a mischievous grin. In fact, I would gladly return to our games during recess. That will do, young Django. That will do. We're so fucked, we're going to die. Denki and Mina shouted in unison, fearing what they would do. Izuku could simply sigh as he uncovered Eri's ears as soon as he expected it to happen. Him and his progenitor, Cementos asked. He knew that some sentient quirks had a preferred relationship term in some cases. They prefer to be called brothers actually. Huh, interesting. It says here that Midoriya's quirk registry recently got updated. It went from clone to arsenal. Although that is set to change in the future once he has proven to be able to make more than 20 clones. Midnight looked over in a tablet. What does he want to change it to? Legion. The room seemed to vibrate at the potential of that word. The spectators could also feel the vibration as soon as the on-screen Nimuri said that. The word Legion felt like something powerful was bestowed to them, and it felt unreal. That is quite a name, Shino said. Rubbing her arms at the goosebumps, she suddenly got. I can't blame you on that one. I felt it too. Yawara affirmed. It sounds cool. Koda mumbled in awe. With a name like that, it sounds like Midoriya could call an army. Tsunagu said, brushing his hair. Yeah, Shinya affirmed. Ooh, Midoriya, that name sounds thrilling, Mina said. Manly. Aijiro and Tetsutetsu chorused in agreement. 
I wonder if my quirk copy would be able to replicate that. Nito wondered. I don't think you could do it since you would need a day to produce a clone and your quirk wouldn't be able to make that. Shihai replied. I think you could only produce a gun or two, probably. Kosai wasn't sure of his answer. Or you could break your arms, Itsuka said dryly. It could go either way, Riaiko decided. All Might took time to observe the boys before moving on to other applicants. Many applicants are showing what it takes to become heroes, speed, agility, situational awareness, adaptability, and pure combat ability. He noticed both Izuku and Django helping people, and it brought a smile to his face. And the capacity to help others, even at the expense of yourself. Nezu smiled sadistically. Let us see, however, what they're made of, power loader. Yes, sir. Pressing a button that said plus ultra, the teachers leaned back to see what these applicants would do when the odds were stacked against them. Many students that took part of the exam groaned in exasperation and fear. One thing is watching the teachers talking about us, which we can now know better of our strengths and weaknesses. Kyoka groaned wearily. And the other thing is how the principal would unleash that monstrosity. Revelry in the dark, Fumikage and Shihai sighed in unison. Izuku and Django soon regrouped and retreated quickly, but relatively calmly, while everyone else panicked. Yeah, not much phased you after taking a smash from All Might and eating his hair. Still though, giant robot. SNK, giant robot. Denki snorted. I can't believe this. I know, right? Where does UA even get the funding for this? Is that really what you're worried about right now? A voice crying out made them both pause, as one they turned. Stuck under some rubble, and desperately trying to get out was Yuraka Ochako. And for one heart-stopping moment, their eyes met. Achakuraka, the students shouted in distress, mostly Class A, at seeing their bubbly friends stuck under the rubble. I'm fine, Ochako quickly assured them. Yes. I was in a pickle, but I was totally fine after the test. Majima could have the zero pointer located her under the rubble? Nezu asked quietly to the support hero. Could be. The programming on the zero pointer had specifically with a sensor that could locate and secure examiners that could have gotten hurt. The hero answered back. Although, the two and few other teachers of UA turned to the side of Kuma floating over them. They turned back to see that there was another Kuma sitting on his throne with a few members of the Class A. Oh, don't worry about that. That is simply an illusion that I cast since I knew that you would have spoken about this eventually. Either way, in the multiverse, there are many possibilities that anything could have happened. Most of them were with Izuku destroying that to save Ochako. Some of them. He managed to move the rubble and escape unharmed. He then grimaced which most people noticed it. And the few? Nezu quietly asked. And the few? Well, Ochako wouldn't have survived the Zero Pointer, as it could also have damaged its sensor, which the results would have been catastrophic for her and the school. The teachers of UA gulped at the thought of one of their students getting killed during the entrance exam. That wouldn't have been quite nice for the school itself and their own selves. You know what to do. Nezu ordered. Majima nodded. I'll upgrade the sensors of the Zero Pointers and have a protective layer so that nothing would damage it. Good luck with that. With that, Kuma disappeared and replaced the illusion before anybody could notice him. Immediately, they both started to run towards her as the robot lumbers above. One for all surged beneath Izuku's skin, crackling the air and making everybody's hair stand on end. Everyone held their breaths as they watched how Midoriya. No, a hero saved someone. Django. Got it. As the villain bot brought down its hand, Izuku leapt up and intercepted it. Sorry about this, boys. Focusing on his arm instead of his body, he charged his arm up to 100%. From deep inside of your heart, Izuku grinned. Detroit smiled, as if the powers of the heavens themselves were in his fist. 
A great tornado of force erupted from the impact point and knocked over everything in the vicinity. Explosions riddled from the point of impact throughout the entire until the entire thing popped off, and the robot itself was knocked backward an entire block. Yeah! Every student cheered with a few just smiling at the sight of their friend and colleague taking out a giant robot to save his friend. Ochako blushed as she watched her counterpart being saved once again by Deku Kung. Tenya nodded with a smile as he watched once again his friend doing something heroic before he could have thought. Suyu and Shota watched with intensity, seeing that their closest friend was someone who could be their dearest companion in their lifetime. Katsuki simply huffed, regretting slowly how he had treated him since they were kids. Izuku shot and crashed backward from the force of his punch to the ground, but he was cushioned by both Django and Uraraka, his arm shredded and bloody a dark purple from the use of his quirk. Django had used the distraction to grab Uraraka from the rubble, and that's how the two were there to catch Izuku. Nice catch, Ochako-chan. Suyu complimented her. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it without Django's help. Ochako chuckled softly. It was a team effort, Tenya declared. That's right. Django affirmed with 77 lightly elbowing his vod. Yeah, good thing you didn't do that last time, right? Shut up, Django. Your arm, Midoriya. What this? Tis but a flesh wound. Every person who knew about the meme laughed, while the few others were more worried about Izuku's arm. He gets to be hurt again, and he would have said, Tis but a scratch. Denki joked while laughing. In the end, he would have ended up in a draw. Hanta cackled. No time for pre-quirk references, Vod brother. That thing is coming back. Django said as he set down Uraraka, and they helped Izuku back up. Adrenaline was an amazing thing now that Izuku thought about it. Yes, yes it is. Izuku agreed with a sage nod. Midoriya-kun, I am concerned of you. Tenya chastised him. But most heroes can go on to protect the people, am I right? He defended. Yes. But there is no need to hurt yourself like that, young Midoriya. Tashinori said sternly. You have to talk, you idiot. Sorohiko scoffed with Murai agreeing with him. Og should have aimed for the head. Izuku grumbled as the trio stared at the half-broken robot that was slowly making its way toward them. You still got them detonators? Django asked as he grabbed the ones he had. Izuku nodded and tossed them over. Is it really necessary to throw grenades? That is dangerous. Melissa said with worry. A. That only happens if you shoot them or pull out the safety pin. For the detonators, you only need to push the button to cook up and throw them away before it explodes. Django explained with a shrug. Since he didn't, they are safe. You managed to blow up a bunch of holes in that thing. If I pop these in I can blow it up more. Maybe even the head. That thing could cause a lot of damage before the exam ends. Let's get rid of it. Izuku nodded and grabbed the back of Django's shirt. One for all charged again sparkling wildly as he prepped to throw Django. Wait, let me help, Uraraka said while tapping Django's back, immediately floating in the air, both he and Izuku to express their appreciation. Moving forward, Izuku spun to gain some momentum. I've always wanted to do this, Oklahoma. A small twister of wind and energy formed around Izuku's rotating body, Django groaning as he was subjected to the force. Smash! He yelled while flinging Django at breakneck speeds towards the zero pointer. Yeet Django, Izuku smiled at the thought. Don't yeet Django, Django grouched. Midoriya kun no, Tenya yelled. Midoriya yes, Shinso grinned. Unfortunately, zero gravity had a negative effect on this situation, because while, for training purposes, Izuku has thrown Django, he was not used to the force necessary in this situation. As such, bam, Izuku and Uraraka cringed as Django slammed into the zero pointer's face, leaving an indent in the metal and leaving him stuck there. Everyone cringed at the sight. Ouch, that has to hurt. Kyoko winced. 
with the force of one for all and the gravity shift of zero gravity. It might have accelerated the force and velocity of Midoriya's throw, Momo explained. That might be the reason of such accident. Django simply groaned, thinking on how much he loved and hated his VOD, while 77 simply patted his back. I'm okay. Django groaned out before shaking his head and turning. He saw the other hand coming close to reach him, jumping off his imprint. He went through the fingers and started running down the forearm, shooting wildly at the zero pointer's eyes. Knocking out two, he felt the metal shift under him as the robot tried to get him off. Diving towards an exposed ledge on one of its chest vents, he grabbed tightly and climbed his way up the top before sprinting and jumping across towards the other. Making his way to the exposed section along its left side, he climbed his way in and crawled through to its spinal base, taking special care to avoid exposed wires and the broken framework. He could feel the entire robot shake, and even was knocked over by impacts of the robot's fist against its own chassis. Moving around, while the robot starts destroying itself. Not a bad plan, but more stupid, Haru said. They need to find the weakness to leave those grenades and blow them up. Kosai humped. Otherwise, it wouldn't work, and it would only endanger with the little life the Zero Pointer has left, Juzo remarked. Kind of reckless, though, Tetsutetsu grunted. Itsuka could only look at the metallic hero in training with a flat look. That is something he would have done the same. The same saying for the redhead of Class A. Made it. Lot more hassle than I'd have lived, but here I am. Setting off one, he then quickly made his way back towards the opening. With a great eruption, the entire spinal base was blown to pieces, the neck and head collapsing onto the body as the entire thing flipped over. Django himself was too slow to escape and so was flung out of the zero pointer and into the air, the shockwave disorienting him and sending him careening towards the ground. Oh no, this is gonna end badly. He groaned as he fell. Wait a second, Kumar raised a finger. His fall, however, was stopped by a slap, and he started floating in the sky. Oh, sorry. Yuroka groaned out while she and Izuku were on top of some floating rubble. Izuku grabbed Django's flailing hand and brought him to the slab. Guiding them down, Yuroka soon let go of her quirk and the three rested on the ground. And now, you can react, Kuma said. So, you slapped him. Mina grinned. I, it was to save Django. Mina. Ochako blushed at the boldness of her friend. Had I not, Django would have gotten hurt, just as Deku-kun did. Forgot to say something? So you asked. Well, Ochako decided to not tell them, and expecting to have Kuma keep quiet. Soon enough, the absurdity of the entire situation made Izuku start snorting in amusement. Soon enough, Django started chuckling and Yuraraka giggled before all three of them started to laugh. As they quieted down, Izuku was the first one to notice and ask, Hey, where is everybody? Did the exam end? Oh, it ended about five minutes ago, young Midoriya. The three of them turned and looked to see the entire UA faculty near them and all three were caught off guard. I'm sorry, what? Everyone laughed at that, not expecting that the three would engrossed in their fight to forget the time limit. Wow. Getting into some dangerous situation, forgetting that they were in an exam and finished just a few minutes ago. Rumi snorted. This kid. I believe that a few of us would also ignore the time when fighting villains so it is something. Ruko chuckled. Wow, they both stopped at the same time. If that's not a clone thing, then I don't know what is. It turns me on. Midnight roared out as her co-workers facepalmed. Really Mimuri, Mike groaned out while Eraserhead continued to nap. Now they're heading over to rescue her. Looks like Midori is charging up the strength aspect of his quirk. Wonder if that strength of a thousand clones actually a plea holy, ectoplasm, and the others exclaimed in shock as they watch Izuku jump in the air and meet the executor's hand. What were you going to say? Mimuri asked coyly to Masakazu. It was hard to tell, 
but he was blushing under his mask, not expecting that Nimiri thought that he was talking about that application. I was only going to say as I expect, that if the clones would have won for all. But it seems it's not. He corrected the assumption. Nimiri simply smiled as Shouta groaned at the thought of his friend being herself. It blew the arm straight off, Power Loader complained. He knew that that was going to be a pain to fix. Well, that's the end of the exam. Call it Mike. Wait, something's wrong. Power Loader cried out as he tried various controls on the computer. That can be explained, Majima sighed, rubbing his head. Think you can upgrade them before this happens? On an ass. Yeah, I can work with that. I think I'm going to add a secondary program in case the primary gets damaged. Good enough. Nezu nodded. What is it, Hajima? Nezu asked as the other teachers got up. Even Eraserhead was fully awake now. The executor bots not responding to my controls. After taking that damage it should have shut down automatically. But it's still moving. It's out of my control. He frantically tried to regain control. But error messages continued to appear. Let's move out and... Hold. Nezu said and the teachers froze. What is the principal thinking? Tanya shouted in distress. If you continue watching you might know. Kuma drawled, sipping his soda with a roll of his eyes. Present Mike, call the end of the exam. Advise the students to immediately go to the gates. Everybody else, wait. But sir, that zero pointers targeting system is on those students. Power loader protested, and soon the other teachers began to interject. Nezu, if you expect me to stand by and watch that boy destroy his body again. Recovery girl started only to be interrupted by Nezu. All Might marveled at his audacity. The students also marveled at the audacity of their principal. Few knew how Chiyo acted when they were being stupid and reckless, and she reacted on that. The heroes glanced at the chimera with mild surprise, but didn't say anything. He will do no such thing. After all, brothers work together, don't they, All Might? As one, the faculty turned towards the emaciated man, who continued to stare at the screen with a grin. You're right, principal, brothers, and heroes. So they watched, as Django was flung towards the executor. Both All Might and Nezu laughed uproariously at his impact with the robot and destroy it from the inside. All were marveled at how the three worked together, saving each other, and laughing together like children. Let's go. Ah, so it turns out that All Might and the principal trusted them to do it right. Setsuna realized in awe. We should have seen that instead of reacting badly, she should aside. And that is what happened, I must admit. You three have impressed me very much with your teamwork and capabilities. As a reward, I will tell you now that all three of you passed the exam. Yes, that includes you, Django. Were you not a quirk, you would be a student. As it is, I cannot give you your direct scores until they're tallied, but congratulations, you three. Nezu said with a smile while Recovery Girl made her way towards the group. Hey, Nezu! Django yelled, while the teachers choked at his boldness. Who won the bet? Is it really the time to ask him about that? Ijiro asked incredulously. And why do you have to disrespect the principal like that? Tenya yelled. Relax, Ida. There was no harm done. See? Django motioned to the show. Nezu only chuckled and shook his head. Now why would I ruin the surprise? Django only responded with a groan. Quite the balls of steel with speak like that to the principal. Denki shivered with Mina nodding in agreement. Why, yeah. You really traumatized them, principal. Tashinori deadpanned. Me? Traumatize the future heroes of our school? Nonsense. Nezu cackled, holding his tray of tea. The staff of UA could only look at their superior with a flat look. All right, that's enough for now. Let's fix the three of you up. No. Hey, I'm just a clone. Wreck. Girl, I'll be. Django was cut off by the sheer terror he felt of having her glare turned toward him. Right here waiting for treatment, ma'am. He quickly finished while lying still. Scary, someone muttered. 
but everyone agreed. HMPH, youngster these days, Chio huffed proudly at her performance. As I thought, she replied before glaring at a chuckling Izuku, shutting him up and kissing his arm. I thought I told you not to do something so stupid. Izuku sheepishly chuckled before replying. A, well, instinct I guess. My body just moved on its own. Chiyo only gave Izuku and Tashinori with a pointy look. You reckless youngsters. Think before you act, you buffins. Yes, ma'am. Both users of Ofa shouted in unison with sheer terror. The others could only hope that the next time they get to the infirmary, they could at least be prepared for the consequences of their actions. Recovery girl HMMed in annoyance before checking him over, satisfied at the end. She gave him a gummy before he fell asleep from exhaustion, giving another kiss to Django to heal from his back injuries, the latter dematerializing back to the mindscape. She then turned to Yuraraka. Said girl eeped in apprehension. But recovery girl was much gentler with her. Now then, dearie, let's fix you up, and please, for the life of me, never bring yourself to be stupid as those two knuckleheads. Yuraraka nodded rapidly, unwilling to have the glare turned on her any time in the future. The spectator Ochako nodded in agreement as many others. Getting a glare for a villain is one thing. Getting from recovery girl is another thing completely which would scare you for months. Only Nezu was chuckling in his tea. Soon enough, she was feeling better from her nausea and injuries. But she still decided to sleep off the adrenaline and exhaustion. They're so cute, Midnight squealed. Nimiri, Eraserhead warned. And can you imagine him using that quirk? She continued her tirade. Nimiri. Or better yet on me. Nimiri. A few students laughed at the interaction between their teachers. Others simply blushed at the implications she was mentioned, and few guilty people were blushing as that thought invaded their minds in an unholy and perverted manner. Kami, just kill me Izuku, while blushing nuclear red, covered his face with his hands and moaned in embarrassment. I just hope that one of the clones managed to curb her. Django grumbled, feeling the same as his vod. You would be surprised, 77 added, much the same. Ochako was blushing at the thought of many Izukis getting on her before nope. Get the gutter out of my head. She hastily shook her head while trying to calm her blush. As the ensuing conflict grew behind them, Nezu, All Might, and Snipe approached the group. I want him in my course, the both of them. Midori is pretty good with that carbine, but Django's natural with them pistols. Shot those eyes while moving and from a pretty good distance. Snipe commented before picking up said carbine. I still marvel at how it just makes M from his quirk. Think E can get met a permanent one. Really, Snipe? All Might asked in exasperation. What? They're pretty useful. No need for reloading. Who knows? May I be E can may I can may I revolver? I'm talking about the accent, Snipe. Snipe just chuckled. Then he turned and went to break up the fight. You certainly picked a good one, Yagi. Nezu commented as they stared at the two, who were now being taken away by medical bots. All Might chuckled. Yes, yes I did. Dad might, Shoto declared. Tataroki kun Izuku shouted with Tashinori coughing blood at hearing that. I told you that All Might wasn't my father. Well, he does act like one. Asui-san. Call me Tsu. While Izuku was getting embarrassed by his friends, the staff of UA, and the heroes glanced at the former number one hero who was simply covering his face. You sure gave him a fatherly figure for Midori, Yagi. Hizashi chided with a smirk. Oh, how heroic of you, All Might. Mimuri giggled. Inji only looked away and ignored every that occurred in the place. Forget those times. Forget those miserable and embarrassing moments. Try to not think about them. He continued repeating those thoughts. Later, after Izuku had woken up, thanked the faculty, and went home, he and Django eagerly spoke to Inko about the day's events and the battle that they took part in. 
Izuku took particular pleasure in mentioning Django's faceplint. Django in turn praised the new girl that Izuku had made friends with. Inko just smiled and laughed, enjoying the time with her two boys. Her own family, both born and, as she looked at Ta smiling Django, created. That is a nice family, Deku-kun. Ochako smiled. Why, yeah, mom is the greatest person for me. Izuku said in embarrassment. A great auntie she is. Katsuki muttered under his breath, with Ijiro barely hearing him. Did you say something, Bakubro? No, you shitty hair. Kayoka and Miso heard him mutter, but decided to hold on until it was necessary. Later that week, the three of them stood with a UA, letters in hand. Django felt particularly touched with the fact that one was addressed to him. Although he was a clone, Nezu had recognized his sentience and semi-independence. That I do, young Django. Nezu hummed with a smile. Django was congratulated by the students from class A uh, and few of class B, which he blushed in embarrassment. Let's open yours last, Django said while opening his letter. A little round projector was then placed on the table, and they were greeted by All Might. I am here, with your test results. Pito might. Everyone laughed, Izuku and Django included, while Toshinori grumbled under his breath about respect. This time Inko smacked Django upside the head. Now, you may be wondering why I'm here. It's because you're looking at Yue's newest teacher. That's so awesome. He's gonna be with us. Another school teacher scandal. Inko smacked Django again. Really, young Django? Toshinori scowled while everyone else was laughing. Really? Don't blame me for having that encounter with you. Django defended with a shit-eating grin. Please, don't curse in front of Iri and Koda, Django. Izuku sighed as he saw Shino covering Koda's ears and Mirio to Iri's. Now then, on to the scores. Young Django, your 40 villain points. If you were by yourself, that would be just enough to make it in. Bah, I got too many one-pointers. I killed like, 30 of them. But wait, there's more. Here at UA, we also recognize actions of courage in helping those in need. Look at this, young Django. You helped a young man in danger. Then that young girl and finally your brother. As such, you gained 30 rescue points. Congratulations. Alone, you'd be third place. Third place? That's amazing, Django. Izuku cheered his Vaughn. That's nothing. Django smirked proudly. Who was the third place of our exam? Kayoka wondered. That would be young Yuraka. Nezu declared, which Ochako blushed. She had gained 28 villains points and 45 rescue points at the moment. So, she's fourth place in the show. Tsuyu mused. All right, third place. I wonder who got first though. Probably me. That means I win the bet Django. Izuku laughed out, while Django shook his head. No, uh, no way. We still got to see yours. You probably got less than me. The two started to argue and wrestle, while Inko rolled her eyes and made her way to Izuku's letter. Grabbing the projection disc, she set it on the table and turned it on. They really act like brothers. Tamaki said quietly. I wonder if Midoriya's quirk would give us a brother like that. Mirio wondered. That would be interesting, Najira gasped. I am here. The words shocked the two boys back into focus, and they quickly paid attention to the man. Now, I'm assuming that Django has already show his disc. How could all might have known that, Sen wondered. Probably by the principal, Itsuka deadpanned. How'd he know? Probably Nezu. Everyone laughed when it sounded the same as they heard by Itsika. So Principal Nezu had me record this second. See? You two already know that you're in, and I'm very proud. Now for your scores. Midoriya Izuku, you got 30 villain points, a few shy of Django. Ha! Shush. But your actions with the surrounded group, saving Miss Yuraka, and your brother have gained you 40 rescue points. Bringing you up to seventy. Ha! Huh. That blasted rat did this on purpose. 
Everyone that bet that they would draw cheered, while the others groaned, giving the cash to the winners. Is it really okay for them to bet in front of their teachers and heroes? Shinji wondered to his group. A. They are not doing anything so it could go either way. You shrugged. Ish, Shinasuke huffed. Wait. They both said. If we both got 70 points, then that means... They turned again to the projection. Yes, boys, you're both correct. Alone you each have 70 points. That means that together, you have combined score of 140 points. They stared at the chart that was projected in front of them. Midoriya Izuku Jango 1340-1340 41st place. Welcome, boys, to your hero academia. The boys loudly cheered, and all three cried tears of joy as they celebrated their success. This was the beginning of their journey, to becoming heroes. Together, everyone cheered that the on-screen Midoriya would do his best. Izuku and Django laughed joyfully at the moment they were sharing, all while ignoring Kuma who wasn't cheering. Yes, he was giving them a smile, but it looked more solemn and sad. Few people noticed his reaction that were Shouta, Shinso, Enji, Tashinori, the past users of Ofa, Nezu, Keigo, and Naamasa. Izuku was slightly nervous as he stood in front of the large door for Class 1 a butt, reminding himself of everything that it took to get here. And hardening his resolve, he opened the door. Of course, it had to be these two Izuku thought in exasperation while watching the confrontation between Bakugo and the teen that Django almost shot. Said teen took one look at Izuku and immediately stomped over. Great first impressions, Toguru snorted sarcastically. At least ours was more tranquil, Yostu said. If by having Monoma shouting the superiority of Class B was something, I guess, Itsuka deadpanned. Hey! Once again, my condolences, Midoriya-kun. Tenya apologized. And like I said, it is fine, Ida-kun. Izuku smiled. He looks like a robot. Oh well. Might as well get this over with. I, Ida Tenya, humbly apologize. It is clear that you are the superior student, he said with a perfect bow. Izuku wondered if he could put a square and see if there was any space left over. You know, I always wondered about that. Tensei admitted. Brother. The Deku squad and few others laughed. Not what I was expecting, he thought, honestly bewildered at the entire change. Huh, guess you can't judge everybody by the first interaction. He heard Django said from the Mindscape. Uh, apology accepted, but I'm no superior student. But you saw the truth of the exam, returning for the girl. Ida recounted. A part of him still felt shame at not doing anything and simply leaving. Look, I saw someone in danger and I moved. That's it. I didn't even know about rescue points till the end. Ida was about to continue, but he was interrupted by another arrival. Izuku noted that it was the last student and his first friend. Katsuki winced at being told that he wasn't his friend anymore. He felt a hand pressing his shoulder and saw Ijiro giving him a small smile. You're doing great, bro. He encouraged him. You did change throughout the year in UA. Katsuki sighed. Yeah, I just hope that any other person like me listened and thought on their own before the toxic environment overtake them. We can only hope, bro. In fact, we can send them a message or something with our actions, right? Ijiro grinned. We are heroes to be so it is our turn to give them an example to follow. Katsuki nodded and continued watching the show all by ignoring that Izuku was hearing and smiling at his bully-turned friend. You did great, Ochako-chan. So you cheered for. So, five rescue points extra. Shoto hummed. You did better than Bakugo. Huh? 
You said something, Isahot? Katsuki snarled, his hands popping with explosions. Calm down, bro, Ijiro said as he held him back. Face to face with a caterpillar, he blushed and apologized before turning and sitting in his seat. I can't believe I almost capped a teacher. Wow, Greeny almost killed his teacher, Satsuna cackled. That's no laughing matter, Takage. Itsuka sighed. He was trained to become a hero, so his instincts are honed. It is a logical reaction. Shouta huffed. Don't be so shy, Shouta. You can tell us. Mimuri giggled. Shut it. If you do that again, you should call it Chicago Smash. Izuku groaned. What? Why are you booing me? I'm right. He heard Django yell off to the clones. Every student booed him with Toshinori's voice being the loudest. Shut it, Toshinori. Sorohiko grinned, giving him a kick. What? Django raised his arms in challenge. I'm right. Kuma covered a laugh with a cough before munching on some popcorn. HMPH, good instincts. And at least you sat down. Either way, it took 15 seconds for all of you to quiet down. That's time wasted. That's someone dead. If anything, the silence became more deafening. Excuse me if I'm overstepping my boundaries, but... Jirota began slowly. Is this how you all began your classes? Yes. Every class a student groaned in unison. Really? Eraser? Sekadro sighed. It is more effective. Shouter retorted. Either way, we're on a schedule today. I'm Aizawa Shouta, your homeroom teacher. Put these on. The scruffy man who was a caterpillar grabbed gym uniforms and set them on the desk. And meet me outside for a quirk assessment. Quirk assessment. We didn't have that at the beginning of the classes. Ibarra said. We did. Again, Klasa said in unison. I'm so glad that Eraserhead isn't our homeroom teacher. Nyanjeki admitted quietly, not willing to let the teacher hear him. Here, here. Kosai gulped. Uh, what about orientation? Yuroraka asked. We don't have time for such frivolities. I'll see you in ten. He said before leaving the room. All of them simply stared before Izuku simply shrugged grabbed a uniform, and headed out. Soon enough, the rest of the class followed suit. After changing over, they found themselves outside near a large track area, most of them later than others. Obviously we'll have to work on your timing, that is if you manage to stay here. Either way, let's move on. Today we'll be doing a quirk assessment test. So far you've all been limited by the government in an illogical attempt to be fair. Here though we'll be pushing you to your limits. He paused as if he was deciding something. Bakugo, you managed the most villain points in the exam. What was your ball throw in middle school? About 67 meters. Bakugo said as he walked forward. Aizawa tossed him a ball and motioned for him to go inside a circle. Aha! Now we can see how Klasa did their quirk assessment test and see if our class was much better. Mito declared in his usual self. Just as the class A, as one, covered their ears. A few other teachers did the same. Uh, what are you guys doing? Yui asked. Use your quirk. Stay inside the circle. Go all out, that's it. Bakugo chuckled darkly as he rolled his shoulder. All right then. He wounded back. Immediately Django appeared behind a girl with dark purple hair and covered her ears. What the? Die. Boom. An explosion rang out the field sending the ball flying and making everybody cover their ears. The girl also clasped her hands over Django's to add more pressure as the sound rang out and left some people reeling. Every person who didn't cover their ears winced in pain before covering their pained ears. Ooh, that's why, Yosu groaned. At least I knew since I met with most of them. Shinso snorted, uncovering his ears. That was a blast. Mei cackled with joy. I wonder if my babies can explode louder than him. Hatsum, no. 
Majima ordered. Thanks, Django. Kyoka thanked him. No problem. Once the sound died out, Django let go and the girl nodded appreciatively. How did you know? I saw you through Izuku's eyes. We immediately deduced that you had some sort of sound-based quirk. I doubt that you'd like to go deaf the first day. Django explained with a soft smile. Thanks. The gratitude was genuine, but she also felt slightly creeped out that her quirk was so easily discovered by a mere glance. Rude. Django snorted. Sorry. Kyoka apologized. Don't be. I kind of expected it. Still, don't think of it much. It depends on the person's characteristics. We wouldn't have known Takoyami's quirk unless he showed it by himself. Few people are easy to discover. Django nodded before heading over to Izuku, unaware of a smiling blonde boy who was glad to see him again and was about to make his way over when the device in Aizawa's hand beeped. Too bad, Ayama, Rikido said. Don't be, Monami. There is always a next time, Yuga declared. 77 could only shake his head with a small smile. Over 700 meters, they cried out in shock as Bakugo smirked, smoke still rising from his palm. This is all designed to push you beyond your limits, and today we'll discover them. All of them immediately got excited, someone even shouting out that this would be fun. Well, we're fucked, Mina cackled with the rest of class, a laughing in agreement. The other spectators glanced at them with a confused look. Izuku and Django both felt the atmosphere change. Fun, huh? Aizawa cut in, glaring. Fine then, let's change things up. Whoever is last gets expelled. Cries of shock and denial rang out from the class, calling it unfair and the like. Natural disasters, villain attacks, injustice, crime, the world's unfair. That's how it works. Here at UA, it's our job to teach you to fight that unfairness as heroes. So either you step up to the plate or leave right here, right now. He beckoned at them, almost mockingly. So show me what you have, plus ultra style. Jeez, Shu, you sure gave me a scare. Hizashi winced. They needed to learn fast on how the world worked. Shouter retorted. No student of mine will do half-assed. And you tell me that you aren't proud of them. Nimiri snorted. Shut it, Nimiri. He grunted, hiding inside his scarf the blush he was forming. He would deny that he blushed. Surprisingly, I am now happy to have Kan Sensei as our homeroom teacher. Toguru declared blankly with most of the Class B members nodding in agreement. Yep. We sure learned the hard way in our time, right, Tamaki? Nijo said. Why, yeah, the shy boy muttered in agreement. Mirio could only laugh since he was from Class B, and Aizawa wasn't his homeroom teacher ever since. Over the afternoon, the students went through the eight tests, each one trying their best to not get expelled. Izuku was practically in Quirk Haven, with so many new quirks that he wanted to document. As it was, he had to rely on his clones for later, he particularly took notice of how many quirks that weren't suited for some situations excelled in others. For example, the side steps were overtaken by some short kid with balls on his head that used them like double trampolines. Another used his quirk to get over 500 kilos on the grip strength test. Really the most interesting was the girl that made an entire electric scooter for the run. You sure know how your classmates' strengths and weakness well, huh? Kuma chided, leering at Izuku. But of course, he immediately answered. I have categorized each of our classmates, from rescue, capture, recon, frontline, support, and underground. Oh, what do you think, Deku-kun? Ochako asked, intrigued as the rest of the classmates and the others. Well, from rescue we have Asui and you, Yuraka. Capture team are Siro and Mainta. Recon teams are Koda. Shoji and Gyro. Support teams are Yeyurazu, Ashido, Aoyama, and Sato. Underground could be Takoyami and Hagakure, and the frontline team are the rest. He declared, surprising most of them. H.M., 
It could work out with Takoyami and Hagakure to be in the underground hero business. Shouta hummed thoughtfully. Hey, what about us, Greeny? Satsuna asked. You might want to ask him later after the show. Kuma interrupted. The others grumbled but decided for later with Izuku assuring them that he would speak with them about that. Yurarakas was the funniest. Sending that ball to space left him and Django in stitches. Izuku wondered if that thing was still in orbit. Someone from Class B coughed. Did she really send that all the way up? Kosai blinked in surprise. Hey, now that I think about it, I did see something fly away. I thought it was my imagination. Manga hummed, with a realization emote. Geez, and I thought that Fukudashi was pulling our leg or something. Yosu admitted sheepishly. My bad. Izuku himself managed well on the tests, the most memorable moments being him and Django working together on the grip test, him jumping with one for all on the standing long jump and landing on Django's shoulders, having him run the rest of the way. That is quite ingenious way of using that quirk. Tenya admitted. We haven't seen much of those people with cloning quirks, so it would be surprising for us. Tsuyu added. Except for that villain, Ochako grimaced. Kago frowned. Yes, he had his thoughts on twice, and the order that the Hero Public Safety Commission, or HPSC for short, gave him. Kuma side glanced at the hawk hero subtly. I should do something about that or speak with Nezu later. HPSC might be the core for the heroes, but they are so corrupt that they would hire assassins from their own programmed children. Might as well. Break the prestigious name of theirs while I have them here. Some of the class laughed at the spectacle, and Aizawa remained dead inside. When he is not, Mina snorted under her breath with Denki snickering in agreement. Ahem. The two tensed fearfully before slowly turning to said teacher glaring at them with his quirk activated. You two said something? No, sir. The other class had decided to remain quiet and not speak badly of their homeroom teacher. Who would think that they would get punished despite not having classes? They won't push their luck further. At the ball throw, however, Midoriya thought to himself what to do. I can't use a big percentage of one for all. I'll just break my bones. Hmm. Django, Izuku said as Django reappeared, sticking the ball into his hands and grabbing him by the collar and waist. Izuku lied down on his back and held up Django with his feet. I choose you, Izuku kicked off, while pushing his body up to 15%, straining his muscles and cracking some bones. Hanta snorted. Really? Did you really use a Pokemon reference? The other classmates from both classes snickered in agreement. What is Pokemon? Shoto asked innocently, which resulted in many people gasping in shock. All right, that is sad and stupid. Katsuki grumbled before snapping his fingers at the usual people of his group. You know what to teach him later. Roger, Ijiro, Denki, Siro, and Mina saluted. Might as well help him know what that is. Suyu said with the rest of her group of friends. I am not much knowing with that, but I know enough to know the basic since my brother had me play the game before. Tenya stated. You really didn't give him much freedom, huh? Rumi asked dryly to the current number one hero. Enji would admit that he had taken Shoto's childhood because of his own greediness. He would say that he was a terrible father, but ever since that attack with Hawks, he had his eyes opened, seeing that everything he had done was a waste. No, no, I really don't anything to say, he sighed. At least young Todoroki is doing well now. Tashinori said. Yeah, I guess. Whoa. Django cried out before landing in in a crouch about fifty meters away. You ass! Django cried out as he started to run. Aizawa merely shook his head before staring at the screen in his hand, the number steadily rising. He could admit that the kid had some good running speed. Honestly, he was actually interested in seeing how far this went. At the same time though, call him back after a minute. We don't have time to waste. Izuku shrugged and nodded, and after the time passed, 
tried to dematerialize Django, but found that he couldn't. Huh. It was most people's wonder. Shouldn't Django have dematerialized or something? Denki asked. Keep watching. I think I know the reason. Katsuki grunted. Huh, I can't. What do you mean? He's too far away. Our connection's really short. I can usually sense my clones, but he's actually gone far enough that I can't. Never had this happen before, good to know. Izuku paused as he suddenly felt everything go silent. All the voices, all the power. Silent. 77 shivered. Yeah, it was like our connection with Orivad got disconnected. I remember when every VOD began panicking on trying to get our connection with Izuku in a hasty manner. I guess, it was better to test it now rather than later, Suyu asked, unsure. Maybe. Shouta now felt guilty that he had done something. But in truth, he knew better that he was curious on how it would react and how it would fare. In a blink however it came back, and he gasped in shock. Huh. Looks like your clones are also independent of you and don't disappear after I use my quirk. Aizawa said while applying eye drops to his eyes. Oh, your eraser head. I thought I recognized you. You were there after the entrance exam. You're an odd case, Midoriya. I was prepared to erase your quirk after your stunt against the Zero Pointer. But you decided not to use your full power. Why? Well... When I did that I completely destroyed my arm, and I can't keep doing that. I'm going to have full control of that strength one day, but until then I'm leaving that as a last resort and using all the other abilities I have with my quirk. Izuku explained, a bit nervous at the piercing stare that Aizawa was giving him. But he still stood tall. Manly. There was no reason to know who said that. Good, you actually have some logic in that brain. Come on, let's go. Aizawa said, walking over to the rest of the class and finishing the rest of the tests. Aizawa stood before the class and presented their scores. Too much of a hassle to put everything. So I'll just put down your rankings. Yeyurazu Momo. Midoriya Izuku. Tadaroki Shoto. Bakugo Katsuki. Huh, it looks like he couldn't win against you. Ye Momo. Kayoka said. That I thought so too. But I know that if we did that again after he trained his quirks, he would have overtaken my place. Momo answered. Just train hard and you'll succeed. Mizo supported her. You are one of our pillars that hold our group. Yairazu. Do not lessen yourself. Fumikage declared with a sage nod. Which ranking he was then? Sen asked. He was the last at the time. But we didn't know before his quirk since he kept breaking his bones. Toru replied. Jirota winced. Yeah, now we know better. And the list went on until the final name. Maita Minor. Said Teen fell on his knees in despair, already lamenting the fact that he'd never be with women. You were most women's reaction. Is he really like that? Shinya asked. Yes. We've been trying to curb his perverted tendencies, but we don't have such luck, Mimiri sighed. I tell you that I didn't know much at the beginning, but from what I heard, it was bad. Hizashi confessed. He's smart by going ninth place in the class and his capabilities. If it wasn't for his, everything. Shouta groaned. There are a few worlds that Minoru Kun was expelled. Kuma stated, shocking most students and heroes but none other than Minoru himself. E.A.? W.I.? Kuma simply gave him a flat and disgusted look. The many worlds I had watched, you were specially a kind of a rotten person that would look at any women without their consent and acted in a racist way. Most of our kind hope that you either learnt your lesson or get the hell out of the school. They mostly think of you like a perverted comic relief. So, listen to me. And listen well, you perverted midget. Learn to be a better person without acting like an animal, or I'll show you the many, many worlds that you were put yourself into. Kuma threatened with a growl that shouldn't come out like an actual animal. Minoru trembled fearfully and quietly nodded. Good, give this a lesson everyone. 
While most universes have good versions of yours, there are others that are not. Kuma huffed, sitting comfortably again. Like I'll tell them how some of the special ones have a perverted level of fantasies. Any nearby girl immediately took various steps away from him. Izuku half pitied him. By the way, the expulsion thing was a lie. I just wanted to see you all give your best. Various exclamations of shock and relief rang out, although Yeyurazu declared it obvious. Izuku, however, was less sure but decided to keep quiet. Now if Django was here he'd immediately call Aizawa out, and that wasn't really the best impression to give your teacher the first day of school. Every teacher gave the nocturnal hero a flat look and sympathy to the students. You haven't told them yet. Nimuri sighed. Not that they need to. I saw their potential, so it isn't much to say about that. Shouta said. Although, I think that a few of them realized when Midoriya's thoughts were displayed. Ken told them. So, Aizawa-sensei was really up front with expelling us? Mina asked frantically. We thought it was again a logical ruse, Denki cried out. I did hear rumors from my brother, but I thought I heard him saying that Aizawa-sensei expelled the now second-year hero students last year and enrolled them again. Tenya admitted with a grimace. I didn't think of it much, and now I'm regretting them. We're screwed, Hanta groaned. But hey, look at the good side. He didn't expel us, so he must have seen potential in us, right? Ochako asked, unsure of her own question. That makes me feel better. Kayoka sighed. Yes, kind of. Momo agreed. Revelry in the dark. Izuku simply sighed at their homeroom teacher's actions, while Django and 77 simply laughed at their VOD's plight. Go ahead and change back. You'll find syllabi on your desks. We're done for the day. Midoriya, stay back a bit. Everyone blinked in confusion. Why would he be left with Aizawa-sensei? Koji asked quietly. Maybe to test his full strength? Rikido assumed with a shrug. That may be so. Mizo admitted with a nod. Midoriya nodded and stayed, while the rest walked back to the school. Look, this entire thing is about finding your limits. You'd pretty logical, but I still want to see what yours are. Throw the ball with your strength aspect. Do what you need to. We can discuss training management later. Izuku nodded before stepping back into the ring. All right, let's not bust my arm this time. Focus. He brought one for all to life, charging it throughout his entire body, bringing his arm to swing, and unleashing 100% at his fingers. The ball was sent soaring towards the sky, rings of air left in its wake as it went Mach 4. Holy shit, green beam, that's some power, Setsuna gasped in awe. Language. Ibarra berated her. And he is holding back all this time? Tetsu Tetsu asked. This is going to go so bad if he gets better, Kosai grimaced, thinking that his quirk wouldn't hold him back. That is a nice throw, Rumi admitted in surprise. Still, he is going to get his bones breaking at this rate, Ruko said with a grimace. He's getting better, Tashinori huffed. Izuku brought his hand back and held it close to his chest. His index and middle fingers mangled, but he still managed to grin. I think that's a good start. Right, Mr. Aizawa? Aizawa shook his head and gave a wry grin. He had a feeling that both he and that Django would be problem children. Hey, Aizawa-sensei is proud of us. Django chided before something white wrapped around Django. Don't test it, Django. Shouta growled, his eyes shining red with his quirk. He would deny that Nimuri and Hizashi were laughing at the sight of a small blush forming on his face. All right, go ahead and head to recovery girl. I'll give her a note. Get yourself fixed up. I'll find your brother. Aizawa said as he started walking. Izuku nodded and made his way back. And don't think I didn't notice that stunt you pulled with your legs. Aizawa called out, Izuku sheepishly ducking in response. Aizawa stared at the little screen in his hand, over a thousand meters with just two fingers, and according to this Django's, still going at 700 meters. 
Just had to have the year with 21 students, huh? He mumbled out before moving along. Over a thousand meters? That's crazy, Denki shouted with Mina. Different on how you threw the ball during our quirk assessment, Midoriya Chan. So you said, tapping her chin. Bakugo would have made a fit if he saw that. Hanta admitted. I would. Katsuki begrudgingly grunted. You admit that you aren't better than him. Shoto needled. Ha, huh, you wanna go, Isa hot bastard? Silence, people. Kuma interrupted. Unknown to the both of them, Bakugo had stayed behind, watching, glaring. He was furious. Not only had he been beaten out by Deku and his worthless clone at the entrance exam, but he was beaten out today, not only by Deku, again, but by two other extras. Now, this. Deku had super strength. Something wasn't adding up. And Katsuki would find out, one way or another. I sometimes forget that you and Bakugo grew together, Ochako said. He seems quite perspective at you. Tanya agreed. Despite that he doesn't want to know anything about you, Shoto added. What do you mean with that, asshole? Kuma groaned, wishing to have something to drink right now. Hey, now he felt how Shouta felt with his class. Shouta, on the other hand, suddenly felt a kinship with the host without knowing why. I thought I told you not to injure yourself like this anymore. Recovery girl asked in disdain as she healed up Izuku's body. Honestly, you're just as bad as Yagi. Toshinori was about to open his mouth before closing it when he received Chio's glare. I'm sorry, he meekly said. Nana took the amusement of her successor. Izuku could only chuckle sheepishly as the wound healed. I just needed to find my limits, at least the damage's less right. He then hissed in pain as recovery girl took the opportunity to smack him upside the head. Just because it's less doesn't mean it's less stupid. I mean, she's kind of right there, Ochako said. Yeah, Izuku said. A continued tirade was stopped by the arrival of Django, who merely raised a brow at the scene before him. Imagine my surprise as I'm running when I hear a sonic boom and a ball soar over me. Yeah, turns out Aizawa helped us discover some things about ourselves. I heard, I felt the connection break, but still maintained form. I thought of something similar when you were knocked unconscious, he said while sitting down across the room. Once Midoriya was cleared to go they headed over to their classroom, picked up the syllabus and headed to the front of the school for the train station. They were, however, sidetracked by some of the students. Hey, guys! Yuraraka waved over to where she, Ida, the girl with dark hair and the effeminate blonde were. I'm more sparkled than effeminate. Yuga declared, mildly offended. Yeah, but you are among the guys that know makeups better, Rikido said. That I do, Mon Ami. I wouldn't be surprised. The girls of class said. Hey, you all stayed? Were you waiting for us? Izuku asked while walking up to them. Yeah, we wanted to get to know you better and walk over to the station together. Yuraraka said as they started to walk. All right, so I'm Midoriya Izuku. And this is Django. You two are? He asked the blonde and girl. I'm Jiru Kayoka. And GM Apple, I am Ayama Yuga. It is a pleasure to meet you. The blonde said with a certain flair, Izuku would describe. Is he actually sparkling, or am I tripping? Nope, he's just sparkling, Izuku deadpanned before he looked thoughtful. Although, what if his quirk helped him sparkle whenever he wanted? It would explain a lot. Yuga smiled dramatically, while internally he was sweating bullets. Kuma leered at him, but did not say anything yet. I actually met Monsieur Mr. Django during the entrance exam and wished to express my thanks again. No need, Frenchie. It's just what heroes do. Yeah, and Django here covered my ears when that loud Pomeranian kid launched that explosion. Jiru snarked with a smirk. She was idly spinning an ear jack with her hand. Izuku immediately wanted to ask questions, but restrained himself. Who are you calling Pomeranian kid? Ears? Katsuki roared. 
you can ask away. Kayoka ignored Katsuki, making him angrier which Ijiro had to hold him again. Both Izuku and Django started to chuckle at the rather apt description though. I mean, he's not wrong, Rumi admitted. Katsuki grumbled, crossing his arms. Bite me, you rabbit munchkin. Rumi, with the help of her quirk, snarled. What did you say, doggy boy? Come at me if you want, shorty. Oh, Kami, why? Ruko groaned in exasperation. Kuma decided to laugh in amusement. Well, it's nice to meet you too. I'm glad that Django's already making friends. You're Ida, right? Izuku asked, turning to the other team. Said teen nodded and introduced himself again. And they started talking about the beginning of the school year and what they had in front of them. Izuku and Django found Ida to be a good person, if a bit too earnest. Ida actually apologized for the confrontation at the exam and Django in turn apologized for pulling a gun at him. That you should. 77 chided. Django snorted. He started it. The group of teens got to know one another as they made their way to the train station. And as their school year began, so did a series of friendships. By the way, Midoriya, do you know that Bakugo guy? Yuraraka asked as they stood waiting for their train to get there. Hmm. Yeah, we used to be friends like, a decade ago. Now he's just an ass. Why? Wow, Midori is being sassy. I like it. Kayoka admitted. That is a confident Deku-kun, all right. Ochako added with a nod. Dubby well, Izuku began. You might not want to answer that, my boy. Kuma said with a tone similar to All Might. I don't sound like that. Toshinori huffed. Yes, you do. Most teachers of UA, said in unison. Well, I know your name's Izuku, so why does he call you Deku? Bah, an old nickname he gave me. It's an insult that means useless. Izuku snorted in derision. Why would he do such a thing? Ida asked in concern. If this was a hostile relationship that translated to UA, over the years, he'd report it. That, I would. Tenya declared, staring at Katsuki. Toxic environment people. Kuma sighed, shaking his head. Toxic environment. Nezu could only chuckle maliciously. With the permission of his students, not that he needed it, and the information that was given by the dearest host, Nezu could have the time of his life destroying lives that deserved. The UA, teachers, and some heroes didn't know how to feel about that. Pity them or not. And then, they shrugged because they had it coming. It's cause I was quirkless, or rather was. I even got the joint and everything, although later I discovered that relationship is more correlation than causation or proof. Izuku went on a small mumbling tangent before Django slapped him upside the head. Eherm, right, anyway, Django didn't appear till I was ten. So I'm a late bloomer, but it didn't change anything between us. He shrugged as if it didn't affect him. But Django could see the slight signs of regret and sadness. That me should have been happier or something, Katsuki groaned, face palming. You might have, but he isn't you. So, Ijiro tried to assure him, which it did good on him. Is there a chance to bring that Bakugo here, so we can punish him? Mina wondered aloud. A, it is a stretch, but I doubt it. Kuma shrugged. Oh, I thought it was like Dekaru, like you can do it, so I was gonna call you that. She said with a slight ditty and a sheepish smile. Oh, so that's where's the nickname come from. Mina teased Ochako who blushed. The other girls glanced with a smirk at the gravity girl, not knowing how to respond to that. I thought it was more ironic to that, Kago said. From the bottom to being hope, he is indeed like all might. Suwo cried out, while actually crying tears. He's good. I am happy to know that Tenya has a great friend. Tensei said proudly. Izuku flushed at the cuteness of it, but still shook his head. Denial is bad, Midori. Mina teased which Izuku blushed again. Django and 77 simply laughed. You say like you don't, Ashido-chan. Kuma scoffed under his breath. 
like the term omnivore for shippers. He was kind of shooting for the usual couples. Karamina was one of them. Yuraraka, I'll be honest. Considering how we saved each other's lives, you're more than welcome to call me Izuku. You already know me as Django. As far as I and the other clones are concerned, you're one of us. Others than I. Shut up, Izuku. Yuraraka smiled in appreciation, nodding and accepting the honor. Then you can call me Ochako. Wow, Yuraraka, you work fast. Kayoka snarked, making Ochako blush nuclear red. Hanta quickly shot a tape to her before she could float away. Do you think that if Midoriya would bring more clones, would he gave his classmates a squad or something? Ken asked the other staff of UA. That might be a possibility. Anan replied. It would be crazy if the kid brought more than to the students. Nimiri said. Imagine having a squad of Midoriyas whenever you worked. Shouta didn't think of much, but knowing his student, there was a possibility that he could come up with a stealth-based training for the clones and following him during his night shifts. I am Yuga. My name is Tenya. A, what the heck, we're all gonna be together in class anyways. Might as well cut the middle man. I'm Kayoka. And so they went forwards, six friends starting their journey as heroes. Django couldn't be happier for them. With that the screen blacked out, and the lights turned on. Well, that was something, Shroom, Kanoko said. Yeah, but it is not finished yet. Kuma interrupted. You might want to restock your snacks, but I wouldn't be so sure since the next one is going to be a bit darker. Tashinori frowned in concern. How dark are we talking about? Kuma grimaced, which was noticed by everyone. Dark enough that I am going to need Eri and Kota blind and deaf until the show is finished. Either that or leaving with a caretaker. The wild, wild pussycats, Mirio and Izuku, were worried that they had to leave them alone. Knowing their expression, Kuma assured them. Do not fear. I have a special room for kids during these hours. Not that I expected to use it right now, and they have enough things to distract them. Kuma clapped his hands and a small feminine robot with a maid outfit think of it like 2B, but wearing more covering outfit than her usual ones. 2B, do you mind taking the kids to the recreation room? 2B nodded as ordered and held softly the two kids' hands. The two glanced back to see the worried faces, but they simply reassured them with a wave before following 2B. After the kids left, Kuma sighed and got the spectators' attention once again. Just remember this, there are many alternative universes that nobody could have expected, but no better than most. Unsure on how to expect that, everyone sat down once again. The cinema theater's light turned off, and the screen lighted up. That doesn't sound right. Yoichi grimaced. No, it doesn't. Higaki said with slow dread at what they were about to watch, as the other OFA users. A dark figure walks forward clad in heavy armor filled with machinery that kept him alive. Not a single piece of skin was exposed, even his helmet sealing him off from the elements. Dark, hollow lenses stared at him, the only light coming from the control panel on his chest and belt. From the man's helmet, similar to a samurai's, protruded two large and flat horns, a mockery of his signature bangs. Toshinori gulped at what he was seeing. The villain had the same similarities with himself, but he was acting like everything he had done was a mockery. Something he was familiar with all for one. The students shivered in fear as they watched the futuristic-looking villain walking menacingly at someone. The heroes, on the other hand, frowned, thinking if they had the capability to defeat such villain since a few of them couldn't have done anything to all for one during the Kamino Wards. Toshinori gulps as he faces the haunting figure that was approaching him, the accursed breathing that plagued his nightmares for days now, especially once he learned the truth of the man behind the mask, the monster who destroyed Midoriya Izuku. Dubby what? Ochako yelped in terror. Who would be capable of harming him? Tenya gritted his teeth in anger, familiar with the feeling when he almost lost his brother. 
He couldn't let his dear friend to be lost. Shoto glared at the image of a villain, his body emitting both fire and ice with the sheer fury that was reserved to his father. Katsuki glared, but couldn't get the feeling that something was wrong with this villain. He should be mad, sure, but there was a feeling of dread and regret. A part of him still surges in fury at all for one's cruelty. First he discovered the truth of his master's grandson, and now this. As much as he wished not to be here, to be back in the old days, it was too late. Nobody batted an ear during Tashinori's rant about his master's grandson, as they paid more attention to the monster that came to destroy their greenette friend. Tashinori calls upon the last remnants of one for all, partially restored to him for one last mission. It wouldn't be at full strength, but it would be enough for one last fight. His final duty. To lay his successor to rest. What? Tashinori gaped in shock as many others. Are you telling me that that villain is Midoriya? Mina asked, shocked. What a mad banquet of darkness, Fumikich grunted. How could it possibly be that a cinnamon roll like him turned into that? Toru asked incredulously. In time will tell. Kuma conceded. Darth Kaifu finally stops and pauses, as if he was searching for the right words. Have you come to destroy me, All Might? Kaifu asks as they stand in the ruins of Jakku. Tashinori breathes in somberly, his eyes opening to face his opponent. I will do what I must. He says, as for the final time one for all flared to life and he ignited his blue blade to counter Kaiofu's crimson. Ooh, lightsabers, Mei said, not sounding too enthusiastic as she couldn't phantom to see muscles with that getup. Melissa was in the same. Kaiofu merely stares for a moment, unknown thoughts racing through his mind, his expression as always hidden behind that damned mask. Then you will die, he says with a certain finality, igniting his saber. Song. I will do what I must by William Ross. With a swipe of his blade, he strikes. Kaiofu's and All Might's blades crash against each other with savagery and Kaiofu was quick to strike again. His opponent dodging once and dodging another blow before striking back. Their blades clashing again before All Might attacks again. The two trade blows, their blades striking each other multiple times before Kaiofu gets close and throws All Might back the latter going into a roll. Not gonna lie, apart from the fight, I like the music. Kayoka admitted, impressed. Yes, it is a great composition, Momo added. I'll send you a few songs later, Kuma offered. From his knees, All Might blocks a few more attacks before spinning and striking, only to meet Kayafu's saber. HM, All Might is using defensive, but counterattacking moves, while this Kayafu uses more aggressive ones. Yasuhiro hummed as he watched both warriors moving and striking to get the advantage. There are moves that are named, Kuma said, watching intensely the show. It is explained in the future. Striking again, they ended up getting closer, and with a spin they end up back to back. All Might blocks another blow before delivering his own and grabbing Kayafu's wrist, pulls him off balance. They clash again, their blades striking a few more times as distance is finally gained between them. Kaiofu then raises his blade into a defensive stance. After so long of being unchallenged, he was unused to an enemy who could withstand him. Readjusting his grip as he guards himself, he stares while All Might slowly brings his lightsaber around and points it toward his enemy. That is not something I expected to be. Tashinori admitted. You mean, fighting with a weapon? Murai asked. Yes. But seeing that the lightsaber scorched and cut the ground like butter, it made me feel like it was the best option. He had considered fighting with a weapon or so when he was in America. But all the time it didn't feel right, and he preferred to fight with his bare fists. I remember the time that Toshi would destroy most weapons as soon as he grabbed them. David chuckled. What a nightmare. Melissa giggled. Rearing back, the lightsaber spins as he leaps forward to attack. Their battle rages and their environment is changed. 
Among a forest of pillars from a battle long decided, a new one rages between two forces of nature, as their blades sing and dance in the empty night, leaving new scars in their surroundings as they push against each other. Red and blue collide once more as Toshinori pushes Darth Kaifu back, before ducking and rolling under a wide swing and rolling from a downward slash. Getting back up to his feet, he brings his saber up to defend against another strike, the two adversaries desperately trying to gain ground, the only other sound being Kaifu's forced breathing. Toshinori then grunted as he ends the clash and strikes forcing Kaifu's away before managing a glancing blow at his hand, pushing him back. Kaifu leans against a pillar after stumbling and Toshinori is quick to capitulate, using what strength he had to punch a pillar and push it down on Kaifu. With a stretch of his hand, he catches it with his power, and Toshinori pushes more, the two forces struggling against each other. Wait a minute, since when All Might can push the pillar without touching, Nito asked in complete confusion. Since never, Izuku noted with a frown. It must be some kind of multiverse thing as All Might goes mostly close combat. But to see him push the air with force, it looks like he is channeling Ofa with his environment. Something he could have used at given chance. Tenya stated. So, something like my quirk. Ochako said as she glanced at her padded fingers. Close. Since when Midoriya could have such power? Ijiro asked. Katsuki grimaced when a thought of realization and terror passed through his mind. He couldn't have, could he? He was a monster, and he used any advantage he had on others. If he gave to Izuku quirks, then... Holy fuck. Your strength has returned. Kaiofu says with a certain interest, wondering what exactly had changed between now and their last fight. But the weakness, he snarls as he forces the pillar away before lifting some rubble with his power. Toshinori's eyes widen as he backs away, cutting the rubble into pieces. Still remains. Charging forward, the two trade blows once more, with Toshinori forced to block a blow from behind and leaving himself wide open for a fist to the face. On the back foot of another clash, Toshinori's feet are then swept out from under him before he dodges a downward strike that carves a deep furlough into the ground. Darth Kaifu then raises a hand and slams into the ground, using his power to shatter the earth, creating a large crevice that then becomes a pitfall that Toshinori falls into. No! Every student shouted. The teacher squirmed into their seats as they couldn't feel helpless as they couldn't do anything to help him. Toshinori grimaced in sadness feeling that he had failed the only person he would consider as his son. And that is why you will always lose. Toshinori gasps and cries out as he falls into the pit, his lightsaber turning off unintentionally. He stares in fear as he sees Darth Kaiofu at the edge of the pit, his blade glowing menacingly in the night. Darth Kaiofu then raised his hand once more, rubble rising to meet his command as he then slams piece to piece on top of Toshinori, intending to crush him, the latter grunting in pain as he helpless against the onslaught. A final, large piece of what was once a building then slams itself on top of all the other pieces, sealing Toshinori in his tomb and cutting off his scream. Everyone was quiet, noting on how Midoriya could have defeated All Might. Mirai couldn't think that apart from that he had thought that Toshinori's successor wouldn't match the symbol that he showed, using his head and skills. Murai had too much to think after watching this. Mirio frowned with a rare sight of a frown of his face, considered that maybe his kuhai was more than he is shown for. The battlefield remains silent once more and Darth Kaifu slightly pants in exertion. Did you truly think that you could defeat me? You have failed, master. He spits out derisively before turning off his lightsaber and turning away. Now for the false hero and the usurper. Everyone shivered at the thought that their counterparts would be next. Mirio gulped, knowing somehow that he had become the next successor for one for all. How he got it, he wasn't sure. But his counterpart better be prepared. Because Darth Kaiofu was out of mercy. 
Beneath the rubble, however, all was not lost. Tashinori strained as he used one for all, holding back the weight of the rubble, each moment sapping more of his strength. At this moment, he feels more alone than ever. No, Izuku mumbled, tearing up. And he remembers. I'll do my best as your successor. A boy blowing up in the sky. All Might, help me. You cannot run, All Might. You should have killed me when you had the chance. I am what you made me. Each moment, the voice began with a soft voice before it turned deranged and angry. They couldn't believe that someone like Midoriya Izuku could have in such way. Django and 77 glanced at each other, knowing from the knowledge they had to learn. A person can fall if not given a hand. And in this case, it seems that Izuku had lost the help around him. But it is in these moments that he also remembers what's important. A boy who loves heroes and desperately wants to fly. A girl who looks at him with such adoration. People who still look to him for guidance. And the smile of a boy he loved like a son and what he would expect of him were he still here. Never stop fighting, all might. He has no choice. He must rise. Yeah, everyone cheered, begging for all might to regain his strength. Shouta grumbled at the volume of the voices, but kept quiet as he was also nervous. To think that his problem child could fall in such way terrified him. He was going to do things right. And as one for all surges through him, he finds the strength to throw off his shackles alongside the rubble as a new resolve surges through him and he climbs out of the pit. Darth Kayafu stalks forward, his prey nearby, with Lamillion down an arm and Bakugo having a hole in his gut. He would be easy to destroy. You look like shit, Bakubro, Ijiro said, worried. With the things he has, he is capable of destroying anyone, Katsuki admitted. Tamaki and Nejire glanced with worry at Mirio, but he simply gave him a reassuring smile, not forgetting that inside. He was feeling unsure on how he could muster his strength against such opponent. But he pauses as he senses strength that infuriates him. With a spin, he blocks Tashinori's heavy attack, the two clashing for only a moment before Tashinori strikes again and again, forcing Darth Kayafu back. Tashinori practically dances as he strikes at Kayafu and forces him to block by using his telekinesis. Their blades then dance together, striking the ground of arcing around their bodies and finally able to get close. He uses his strength to push Darth Kayafu flying back, the latter crashing harshly into a thick wall. Falling to his knees and gasping in pain, he can only stare in horror as Tashinori slowly bulks up one for all enshrouding him in golden lightning. Although it was not the same strength nor stature as before, it is still no less intimidating. That's so manly, Ijiro and Tetsutetsu breathed in awe. I should have expected that if All Might had the same characteristic as yours, he would have had those lightning around his body, Deku-kun, Ochako stated. It would have been quite direct into thinking that you and All Might were the same, Kiro. Tsuyu bluntly said. Secret loving child. Shoto deadpan. I told you All Might's not my dad, Izuku whined, rubbing his eyes. All Might then leaps forward and Kayafu barely has time to bring up a telekinetic shield before he is battered by a series of brutal blows from All Might's fist. Groaning with each strike, finally pushing through the blows, Kayafu brings his blade up to strike against All Might's only to be blocked. The two glaring at each other through glass and light. Darth Kayafu, in his rage, strengthens and pushes forward. The two crashing through another pillar and falling down. Their fight increases in brutality and desperation as their blades crash against each other multiple times. All Might stabs forward, only for Darth Kayafu to dodge and grab the man's wrist. All Might then raises their arms together and grabs his hand before spinning and bring his blade down on him, only for blue to meet red. Still, Darth Kayafu weakens, unable to react as fast as Tashinori, who brings his blade back and strikes him from below with the hilt, knocking his chin up. 
All Might then delivers a series of brutal strikes with his hilt directly to Darth Kyafu's control panel. Sparks shooting out as his breathing apparatus beams to weaken as evident by his strained breathing. That should weaken him up, Toguru said. Yeah, there was no other option, Bondo sighed. Ibarra was praying that no more deaths to occur in that universe and that the reign of Darth Kaifu would end. Another strike from the blade is hastily blocked by Kaifu, as All Might then grabs a large piece of rubble and slams it into Kaifu's side, making him grunt and forcing him to stumble away. They both take a moment to breathe, but Kaifu is relentless as he stumbles forward and strikes, only for All Might to easily sidestep and counterattack. He forces himself to ignore the scream of agony that erupts from his opponent as his blade carves a deep cut into his back, making Kaiofu fall to the ground. It's done, Denki gulped. Maybe, we can't be so sure. Izuku said as while the villain was down. It could happen anything during the middle of a battle. Everyone else continued paying attention. All Might does not go for the strike instead hanging back and keeping his defense, making sure to point the blade directly at Kaifu and watching him shakily get up to his feet, wheezing as he stumbles a bit. The clash for only a moment before All Might flicks a finger, the condensed wind blasting Darth Kaifu back with a grunt. All Might pants and glares before charging forward, his blade humming with each step as he leaps and strikes, Kaifu attempting to strike beforehand but missing entirely. The blade cuts deep into the helmet, sparks flying everywhere and Kaifu finally falls to his knees defeated. All Might is once more victorious. Or is it? Tashinro frowned sadly as he watched his counterpart gaining victory against his successor. But this was a hollow victory. Tashinori stands tall and guarded, his enemy defeated and kneeling before him, the raspy breathing from his damaged suit echoing in the ruins of the city around them. The villain in front of him struggles to breathe, wheezing in exertion as his helmet sparks from the damage it just took from Tashinori's saber. Wheeze Hanar. Tashinori took a few steps back from his defeated enemy, blue blade at the ready, as he kept hearing the broken man before him struggling to even get up. Wheeze Aug. Falling slightly before catching himself, Tashinori allows himself to slightly lower his blade, as he realizes that his enemy will not be able to fight again. With great effort, Kaifu lifts his head, a large part of his helmet gone alone with left side, revealing a bald, horrifically scarred head from burns that had occurred ten years ago. Everyone gasped at the sight of their friend turned into a horrific version. Chiyo growled in anger when she saw that Izuku had third-degree burns and knowing how he was, it was a miracle that he survived much damage. Inji looked with a regrettable look as he was also a hero with a fire quirk that burned many villains, leaving from first to third degree of burns. It could have been said for his first son on how his quirk wasn't compatible with his body. Finally, Tashinori's eyes met the exposed eye of his fallen opponent. Blue meeting yellow tinted green, glaring at him with such hatred and anger it physically made him hurt, because he knew that face, as scarred as it was, and he knew those eyes, as corrupted as they were, and his heart stops, and although he was panting from exertion, although he had long been lying to himself that it couldn't be possible, that he was gone, dead, he couldn't help but gasp out the name, Izuku. The armored figure finally manages to get up to his feet and stares at Tashinori hatefully his visage full of disdain as he spoke, his vocoder mixing with his natural voice due to its damage. Izuku is gone, I am what remains. Seeing Midoriya Chan with those eyes feels wrong, Suyu said, slightly shivering in fear. We knew that Midoriya Kun was smart and dedicated, Tenya slowly uttered. But, seeing him like that, it is not Midoriya, Shoto concluded. Ochako glanced at Izuku, who kept his head down. He couldn't believe that this version of him would fall and vengefully attack heroes. What could have possible happened to him to turn him into Darth Kaifu? Deku-kun? 
Izuku was brought out of his thoughts by his first friend. Are you all right? Izuku could lie and tell her that she was fine. But that wouldn't have been truthful, and she wasn't like the others. Gulping slowly, he shook his head. And no, seeing myself like this, I... She grabbed his hand and gave him an assuring grip. It's all right. We couldn't have known how much Darth Kaifu would have fallen. And I hope that in that version of you, has a slight hope for heroes. I hope so, he muttered quietly. Kuma, who remained quiet, sighed. Years ago. Come on, Kaken. Why do you always get to be All Might? I want to be a hero too. Fat Chan, Deku. I'm always the hero. Now hurry up and get ready. Fine. Can I at least pick a villain name? Ugh, fine, sure. Hurry up. Awesome, then. My name will be Kaiofu. Ha ha ha. Face me, All Might. Face me, heroes. To think that such dark name would come from a child. Mizo sighed sadly. What does Kaiofu even means? Pony asked. Fear, terror, dread, dismay, horror, and scare, Momo intoned. That checks out, Shihai grunted. Are you all right, my boy? Izuku hears as he starts from his dream. He turns and looks at one of his closest friends. Even since he'd been stuck in the hospital, his help had been instrumental in getting over his depression and physical therapy. Now it seems that we are watching the core and rise of Darth Kaiofu. Nezu concluded. What did happen to his arms? Mimiri shrieked in a gasp. When a body isn't prepared to hold one for all. Tashinori declared sadly. Everyone turned to the former symbol of peace in shock. Are you telling us that Midoriya could have broken his limbs with that quirk? Shouta shouted incredulously. So, we got a version that Midoriya managed to hold the quirk, while that way couldn't. Hizashi gulped nervously. It couldn't have been pretty. Ken said. At least he had some company, GRR. Ryo growled. Katsuki watched, as if the nerd couldn't hold All Might's quirk. This would have been the result. Would he be able to see him? Or would he have ignored him for being an idiot? I'm fine, just remembering old dreams. My boy. It's all right. Izuku tries to placate his friend. His hands raised up to wave off questions. But the glint of metal caused his expression to sour and his heart grew heavy. It's not all right, my boy. You were cruelly denied your dream for so many years, and when you finally got the opportunity, it slipped through your fingertips. And here you are, in a hospital bed. Izuku deadpans at him. Wow, you really know how to make someone feel better, huh? He asks sarcastically. While morbid, everyone agreed with that answer with a chuckle or snicker. Izuku and Toshinori chuckled too, since they could at least admit that it was funny. You know what I mean, my boy. What I'm trying to get at is that, well, you have a right to be upset. You deserve to be angry, to be sad, to embrace your emotions. Aren't you always talking about remaining in control? I said to embrace your emotions, not let them control you. A quiet yet comfortable silence remained between the two of them as Izuku slightly leans against his friend's taller frame. Let me tell you something I learned long ago. You may call it a tenet, or a code of sorts. I personally don't follow it completely, but I believe that you may benefit from it. Oh? Yes, it goes like this. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion I gain strength. Through strength I gain power. Through power I gain victory. Thought victory. My chains are broken. I shall be free. I didn't teach you that. Nana was confused. There wasn't any code or something like that. Tashinori said, much confused as his mentor and the others. Maybe something that in that universe I learned. In a way. Kuma nodded. Peace is a lie Izuku contemplated as he looked at his metallic hand. I'll leave you alone now, my boy. Think on my words, won't you? Of course, Izuku says as his friend walks out of the room. Sensei. Why do I feel wrong in so many levels? Hanta asked in dread. Yeah, no kidding. 
I feel the same. Denki said. I think most of us do. Momo stated. To think that one simple word could harness such impact. Fumikage declared. Hi, Izuku. How are you? Achako said as she walks into the room with cheer. He smiles brightly at her in return, and they share a soft kiss that always left him flushing. Both Izuku and Ochako blushed as many others gasped in shock or gushed on how cute they were. Mostly Mina, Toru, Satsuna, and Pony. How cute! Toru squealed, watching this cute scene which was a better way than the previous scene. How come you two aren't dating? Mina asked, whining that her ship wasn't sailing yet. Just that, the two continued blushing and avoiding glancing at one to another. Tashinori and Nana simply laughed good naturally. I'm doing great. The physical therapy's going smoothly, and soon enough I'll find myself out of here. How about you? I saw you on the news today. It was great seeing you at the sports festival. I'm doing fine. Bit sore that I lost. But in the end, everything was great. Hopefully I get some good internships soon. She said as she sat next to him and began to rub his hair. He leans against her touch and smiles calmly at the feeling of her fingers gently drifting across his scalp. That looks fine. Unknowingly, Izuku and Ochako were thinking the same thing at the same time. Kuma could simply chuckled under his breath before he got caught. I'm sure you'll do great, wherever you are. Yeah, I only wish that you could be there with me. She said sadly. Yeah, me too. But I guess that just means that you'll have to be the hero for the both of us, right? Right? They stay together, cuddling and sneaking in some kisses every now and then. Eventually, she had to go, and after one final, lingering kiss, they said their goodbyes. I love you. I love you, too. Aw, how cute. The girl cooed at the cuteness and romance it was displayed. It feels like we are watching a romantic show. Denki said. We are watching a down, jamming way. Kayoka snarked. How are you doing, Yuizuku? Toshinori said as he sat next to his would-be successor. I'm doing fine. The recovery process is going well. Hopefully I'll get to leave here soon. Izuku said as he flexes his metallic hand. Me as well. I do have that tour of UA. I promise you. All might. Izuku groans, exasperated. The man tries to do something every day to repent for his mistakes. He had been told countless times that it would be unneeded. Hey, I promised that I would help you achieve your dream. While it might not have worked out the way we wanted to, I still want you to come. I've been talking with Nezu. Your analysis skills are still top-notch, and he's willing to take you on as a student if you pass his test of course. Tashinori says as Izuku begins to tear up. You'd really do that for me? Izuku asks shakily. It's the least I could do, my boy. Not a day goes by that I don't regret what happened, but never doubt that you aren't important to me. No matter what, you will always be the ninth. Tashinori says as he hugs the boy he loves like a son. But knowing now, I would be so sure that Midoriya would have become my protege. Nezu admitted, surprising many teachers. In fact, I may add a little lecture and classes for Midoriya after this. Toshinori and Shouta glanced at each other with worry. They knew that Izuku was smart, but how would he fare against Principal Nezu? Izuku, I'll be back soon. I'm just going to grab something from the cafeteria, okay? Okay, Mom. It's not like I'm going anywhere. Izuku. What? It's true. Izuku chuckles as he turns back to the news. Both mother and son have a great dynamic. Mimiri cooed at such wholesome moment. Even between family. Who would have thought that Midoriya has a sense of humor? Itsuka asked. I do, May chirped. May, Izuku blushed in embarrassment. When he comes to the support department to adjust a few gears, we sometimes joke around and such which he is a great company. Oh, child, after this you might have more. Kuma chuckled. The villain attack is moving straight down Kyoto Street, and, 
He hears the reporter say before he starts to tune her out. It was hard to watch heroes nowadays, even though she was getting better. Wait, Kyoto Street. Isn't that the street where oh? The world turns black. Everyone was silent. Before shouting started. Midori Yazukudeku. Everyone shouted in confusion and worry at their friend. Django and 77 gripped their seats, knowing that they couldn't do anything to help their Oravat. Why must the world make Izuku's life miserable? Why couldn't they let him live joyously with his family and friends without worrying? Was it too much to ask? Izuku himself couldn't know how he felt. Before himself, he was more worried about his mother and he hoped that his mother counterpart lived through. Izuku groans as he tries to regain his senses. He tried to push himself up, but found that he could barely move an inch. His vision slowly focused, and he grimaced in pain as he felt a horrible pressure on his lower back. Looking behind him, he saw that his bed had been flipped over. The hard metal digging into his back with a ceiling on top of it. His left arm was pinned, and it felt like his legs were trapped. Gah, somebody, help me, he chokes out. He was scared, terrified even. For his life, for his survival, for his mother. Where was she? Was she safe? Mom, he coughs out. Somebody, help, me, all might, Achako, Izuku gasps out, slightly delirious as he calls out for those that wouldn't even be nearby. Come on, come on. Toshinori pleaded for his counterpart to find him quickly. He wasn't the only one. Hurry up. Where is she? Ochako mumbled, begging to find him hastily. She was having the best of her life with being with Deku Kun, and she was worried that he would die, bleeding out. Katsuki gritted his teeth, hoping that his counterpart could have at least some kind of brain to save the nerd. But somehow inside, he knew better. Then a voice in the distant, familiar, one that he'd hadn't heard for months. Out of my way extras, die. Kaken was here. Surely he would save him. Oh Kami, Katsuki groaned. Was this how he sounded? K Kaken, help me. Huh? Deku, what the hell are you doing here? Bakugo spits out in fury as he looks at the pin boy. Please, help me. Another explosion rocked the area from behind Bakugo, who turned around in anger. Save yourself, Deku. I've got villains to kill. He yells as he blasts off into the distance. What? Izuku gasped out, disbelieving. Kaken, you've... you're kidding, right? You're coming back, right? Izuku chokes out before smoke fills the air, and he turns to look behind him. Fuck. What the hell is wrong with that version of me? Katsuki raged out, disappointed on himself. Dude, you were just there about to help Metaria. But you left him. You abandoned him. What the hell is wrong with you? Tetsutetsu shouted. You think I don't know? If I ever get the chance, I'll wring my own neck with my own hands. Izuku choked and lowered his gaze as he couldn't see himself suffer through that. His mother couldn't hold much if she ever saw that. Wait. His mom? Where was she? A spark had ignited a fire in this section of the hospital, and he stared at it in terror as it slowly approaches him. Kaken, please, save me. Somebody, anybody. His trousers ignite. Izuku screams in pure agony as the fire quickly travels up his body, him helpless to do anything. Every student avoided the scene not willing and stomaching the view of their dear friend suffering from burns in agony, alone, with nobody there to save him. The heroes frowned, feeling the urge to jump up and save the kid. Only that they couldn't and could only watch how a hero-to-be was suffering. Ochako choked in tears, trying to ignore the screams. She couldn't. Tenya gritted his teeth, his hands gripping hard on his seat as he could only feel helpless. Shoto's body combusted both ice and fire at the sight of the hero, who saved him burn away. Like the stories he heard like his brother, Talia. Chuyu croaked sadly, as she avoiding seeing her dear friend burning to death. Those that took it hard were Izuku and Toshinori. 
Izuku couldn't believe that there was a version of him. Suffering and lonesome, while Tashinori couldn't bear to hear his successor dealing with that kind of undeserved punishment. Finally, he snaps, as everything horrible that had happened to him played itself over and over in his mind. The taunts, the bullying, the burns, the loneliness, the false hope, the destruction of his own body, as one for all betrayed him. And now, his own immolation. I hate you, Izuku roared out as he continues to scream in pain his robot hand weakly extended, trying to grasp at anything, anybody. But it fell down, with nobody to reach for it in return. Before the fire could consume him, and before he could be relieved from the pain by blissful death, a black and purple portal opened up beneath him, whisking him away. Oh no, Izuku gasped as he and few others recognized the portal from the Yasuje and many other shenanigans that happened during their year in Yue. Now he's going to be recruited by that bastard, Katsuki groaned, disappointed in himself that he was one of the many reasons that he got him into that position. Many heroes and teachers grimaced at that. The cool air stung against his burned skin, as did the cold concrete below him. But it was a fair better pain than what he'd just endured. Izuku's robotic hand. The covering burned and melted off, revealing its components reached out and dug into the cement. The metallic fingers buried themselves with an unknown strength as he desperately tried to survive, each movement causing him to moan in pain. There he is. He's still alive. A familiar voice says, bringing hope to Izuku. He peers upward, and there he was, Sensei. No, he is not, Tashinori gritted out, feeling the burning feeling of Ofa with the desire to maim the villain. Sensei had come to save him. Tell the doctor to prepare for immediate surgery. Izuku flips himself over and Sensei walks next to him, kneeling and placing his hand on Izuku's burnt chest, the touch immediately bringing relief. Sensei, SHH, my boy, save your strength. Later, as he found himself strapped to the hospital bed, Izuku hears his Sensei once more. Poor child, abandoned by the world. Nobody came to save you, did they? Sensei, I am here, my boy. And I am but a humble man simply looking to right the wrongs in this world. For example, look. Turning his head to a screen that just turned on, Izuku's eyes widened as he saw the news. Hero in training. Dynamite. Praised for work in defeating villains. He, he's getting praise for it. His rage and hatred were increasing as he started to snarl. Then his heart broke. He saw Mirio, Ochako, and All Might, all at the scene, looking for survivors. But when they were interviewed, young Dynamite did excellent work. Dynamite's got some skill. He should have focused more on the hospital and its patients, Ochako. Dear Ochako said, while trembling. But I guess he did all right and his heart shatters. No! The three named people bolted up from their seats with a shocking look. No, I wouldn't assume like that. Heroes need to prioritize the people if there is slight chance of saving them. We cannot simply give up, Ochako cried out. Defeating villain is important, yes, but they should have tried to look for survivors. Not accepting just like that, Tashinori yelled. Mirio gritted his teeth sitting down. He knew how helpless he felt as he had once lost his quirk during the raid. He gained hope when he recovered too. But if he couldn't save one person from that, he shouldn't be accepting like that. Tamaki and Nejire watched at their friend with worry, as there was a time after the raid that he confessed to them that he felt regret and disappointment when he let Iri go with overhaul. It was one of his worst decisions and he couldn't live with that despite they had saved her. Katsuki covered his eyes with his hand, feeling inadequate on saving the only person he could match up with determination. Yet, yeah, there, he only showed himself like an arrogant hero. Not worthy of being called a hero if he couldn't even save one person. What's good is being a hero if you were going to have the blood of the innocent in his hands? Remember this everyone, Kuma slowly drawled. Not everyone can save people, but you have to practice 
and be good to be able to save the masses. A few heroes nodded in agreement, while the students took attention to that. They felt that they needed to practice more to be better. They didn't even know. They didn't know that he was still alive. That Bakugo was getting praise that was completely undeserved. He would destroy him. He would return to them. He would get them back. Izuku turned his head back to the man who saved him, rage clear in his eyes. I will help you, my boy. I will give you power and strength to create your own destiny and destroy those who wronged you. You need only serve me. Izuku's eyes burned with hatred as he looked at his savior, unaware of the corruption that would soon infect his mind with darkness, perverting his thoughts and perceptions as his eyes turned a red-tinged yellow. Yes, he rasps out. Sensei chuckles and smiles. When I get my hands on him, I'll kick his head off his shoulder. Rumi promised vindictively. Do it after I maul him with my teeth. Ruko snarled, her throat growling with a draconic tone. Good. Although I should warn you, this will hurt. Then he removes his hand, and the pain returns tenfold. Izuku was swept away in darkness and found himself in a laboratory. A familiar doctor appearing and commencing the procedure. Every step was excruciating. Every poke and prod made his body feel as if he was back inside the fire. His last limb was amputated, and all the prosthetics replaced with new ones as he was eventually covered in a full body suit, various pieces of machinery inserted into him, all to help him live. Then there were the black rods that pierced his flesh, inserting something alien into his body, a pain that almost made him black out. But he refused to succumb, somehow knowing that all this pain, all this suffering would serve him. Finally, the last piece. Izuku stared with no small amount of fear, as the mask lowered towards his face, its eyes opening to show red lenses. As it was lowered, he could only whisper out one thing. Save me, all might. That I will, young Midoriya, Tashinori whispered, a tear falling from his eyes. But he would not. The mask connects with the rest of his suit with a hydraulic hiss and whine, the helmet being connected last as the suit finally pressurizes. Ku Kira. The bed slowly rose up, as the newly created person was risen from the ashes of his former self. All for one stood next to him smiling sadistically. My boy, can you hear me? He breathes for a moment, adjusting to it, before replying. Yes, master. All for one was pleased. It seemed that All Might's failed apprentice would be very useful in the future. Where is my mother? Is she safe? Is she all right? All for one pretends to mourn as he faced the boy. It seems that in the conflict, the heroes failed to save her, even killed her. In shock, he turns forward, unable to comprehend what happened. It it can't be, she was alive, I know it. Izuku choked out a sob, not willing to accept that his dear mother would have died. He couldn't. Django and 77 patted his back in reassurance while glaring at all for one. All clones had a first rule that everyone followed. Nobody touches the mother or their vod and gets away with it. He groans as the entire room starts to tremble, machinery and tubings being crushed under an unseen force. He tore off the restraints, forcing himself to take his first steps. He screams in agony as all for one smiles. Yes, he would be useful indeed. Every student and hero glared at the villain. No monster that had tormented everyone. No matter whether there was going to have a battle or a war, they will be prepared, and the forces of all for one will know how the heroes did their job against such opponents. Telekinesis, kinetic blasts, emotional enhancement, pain conversion, and more. His previously quirkless body had been perfect for managing the quirks that had been given to him by his new master. The dreaded antithesis to one for all. All for one. Ironic, the former, created to save, had destroyed him. While the latter, created to destroy, had saved him. Tell me, my boy. Now that you have risen anew, what shall you call yourself? 
Shall you remain tied down by your old name? Bowed on his knee, he shakes his head in denial. Midoriya Izuku is dead. I, I am the darkness that remains of him, and I will strike fear into the hearts of the false heroes and corruption of this world. His words were accompanied by the accursed breathing, but it was all to keep him alive. All for him. All for one, having previously looked into his memories with a special quirk in his collection. Smiles, it couldn't be more poetic. Very well then. Henceforth, you shall be known as Darth Kaiofu. Darth Kaiofu breathes deeply, as he feels power flow through him. Emotional enhancement allowing him to use his rage as fuel. And there it goes the name of the new villain. Kego grimaced, his feathers ruffled in contained fury. Don't worry. Inji growled out as his flames blasted off his costume in eagerness. He won't live long after this. Arise, my apprentice. For while Tamira shall be the paragon of the League, you shall be its shadow. And when the time comes, you will have your revenge on those who wronged you. Yes, master. Darth Kayafu said as he rises and takes his place by all for one side. It seemed that his master's words were true. Peace was a lie. With that, the screen turned off and the lights turned on. Everyone was quiet and Kuma couldn't blame them for that. They had watched Darth Kayafu, as it is one of the many dark-themed stories Draconis made which in turn, everyone will see how much a change, a decision that could turn to their world upside down. After another pregnant pause, everyone was surprised when the silence was broken by the last person they expected. Why would you show us this? Katsuki asked, his voice not sounding the usual arrogant tone class I was used to. Kuma glanced at Katsuki. He wouldn't admit it, but there are stories that he wished that Katsuki would be better since the beginning. For him to know struggle when he was entitled to everything. With a sigh, he answered. To show that have consequences, Bakugo Katsuki. Now, Midoriya Izuku is his own person and his actions are his. And while there are countless universes where All Might's words break Midoriya and lead him to villainy, the fact of the matter is that he was only the straw that broke the camel's back. But there is one near eternal, universal constant. He raised a finger and pointed it at him. You, your actions, your influence. Your daily abuse combined with everyone else's in his day-to-day -day have led to the deaths of trillions across the multiverse. You think Darth Kaiofu is bad? Just wait until you see Lockdown, Megatron, King Ghidorah, Thanos or better yet, all for one. Everyone choked at the thought of Midoriya Izuku having all for one. There's a universe where Izuku has all for one? Tashinori gritted out. Kuma closed his eyes and raised an arm. No. There are universes. The Deku squad choked. As in, plural? Tenya said in dread. Much worse, Ida Kun. Kuma sighed as he began walking to the doors. There are much worse. Take an hour to rest. We will return after you have taken your break. And that, everyone watched as Kuma opened and closed the doors without looking back. They now were thinking, how much they were going to learn in this place.